Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is David. Today I'm going to show you this amazing and cool newspaper website using Next.js. This is going to be a full stack project with the complete front end and the back end. And we are connecting this application to the MongoDB database as well. So this is going to be a very interesting course. Once you learn it, you will know how to use Next.js to build a full stack project. And your web development journey will get on to the next level. So let me show you what this application can do. First, when you look at the home page, you will see this banner section, which allows the user to swipe around and show the heading news. And then down beneath, it's going to be all the trendings and the heading news and also a couple of news. So whenever you click on any individual cause, it'll take you to that individual item. Say, for example, this one. I click on it, it'll take you to that individual item. Uh, this data is fetched from the backend database, uh, not from the static file. So and also on the side, you will have the popular data and the training news. These are from the database as well. So whenever you click on any of those, it will take you to that individual page. So that's what it is. And on a second navigation, you will get to see all the posts that have been made. And among each, it will give you that routes and the click clickable events to take you to that individual page as well. So this one goes to the individual one, right? So the second navigation, um, the third one after it, is going to be the create a post. So this will allow the user or you to create a new post and upload it to the database. So if you want to say, for example, you enter some title. So let's say just this is going to be a sample news and image URL, which is um, currently um, type in something random because eventually we're going to type in some um, image URL here. Um, and a category you can just fill in. Maybe you want something in fashion and author and just give a name. And here in the brief, we're just going to uh, type in something in random. Um, actually, uh, I want to put in some lorium here to make it look formal. So I'll put in some lorium words. And in terms of image URL, instead of typing a um, invalid URL, what I'm going to do is, is to type in that valid uh, route for us to access the image stored on our local file. So I copy and paste in that route. This is going to be a route that stores one protrude image. So once we have all of those data entered, so I'm just going to say uh, post item. And you can see the response from the backend has been sent back and say that the news has been posted successfully. So how do we check if this one has been posted? If we go to post, and you can see the last item, the image, and also the sample news with the title is the one that we just posted. We click into it. You can see that Lorem paragraph that we just put in. And this is the image that we just uh, filled up with the image routes. And uh, if you look at it, down the bottom, there's a two amazing buttons here. One is the uh, update button. So if you click on this one, it also takes you to the post page. But instead of creating a new post, this will allow you to edit the existing post. So to, to test it out, I'll say that we update the title by saying this is going to be the sample news um, update. So remaining information, just keep them the same. Let's see if this works. So we say update item. And now you can see your news was posted uh, successfully. And then we go to post to see the last one. As you can see the title here, sample news update. So this one has been updated successfully, which means that we have made a successful put request. All right. So the last action we're going to show you is um, this delete button over here. If you click on this delete button, it'll delete the random item that we just added to the database. Let me show you. Just pay attention to, I click on this one. And it takes me back to the post page. Scroll down, you can see the thing has disappeared, right? So the thing we just added got removed away from the database, all right? So in the previous few steps, I have shown you the get request, the get single request, and also the post request, the put request, and also the delete request. So we are building a full stack website with all the CRUD events. And um, this project is going to handle the full stack um, activity with all of them. The remaining page, one is the about page to introduce the company history and team. And the other one is going to be the contact. The contact is also going to be linked to the backend. So we can record users information and messages and have those things recorded in the database. And um, the reason to do so is because you want to analyze the user's message to see if anything uh, going on or any trends it could occur, um, it could happen to find in the string. Okay, so that's pretty much it. The last thing is going to be the footer component. Uh, which give you the navigation again. And also in the footer, we also get to see the most recent post based on the date. And if you click on any of those, it'll take you to that individual page as well. So any place is all linked up. It's the fully functioned full stack website. All right. So if you're excited about this uh, 
digital news project, uh, please subscribe to my channel and open up your code editor. Let's just jump in and build it right now. So to quickly start up this project, what we need to do is to open up your terminal on your laptop or computer, and then we type in npx create next app at latest. So this is like the uh, common way of creating a Next.js app. And then after this, uh, <clears throat> these keywords, you just type in your uh, project name. So we can say that this is going to be a, a digital um, hyphen news app. So once you've done that, just click on enter. So it will ask you, do you want to proceed with uh, uh, this version? And you say, yes. Why? Go ahead. Do you want to use TypeScript? Yes, we are using TypeScript for this one. Do you want to use ESLint? Yes. Do you want to use Tailwind? Again, we're not using Tailwind because we're using uh, Bootstrap for this project as well. So we say no. Do you want a uh, source directory? Yes. Do you have any um, app router? Uh, yes. Uh, do you have any aliens? No. So once we've done that, I, I will build this project for us. It's probably going to take a few minutes uh, depending on the internet speeds. Sometimes it loads really fast. While I'm talking, I can see this one's loading really fast. I don't have to pause the video, it's done already, okay? So now this uh, project has been successfully built. So what you need to do next is instead of starting off the project on this terminal, we're going to open up the terminal in our editor. So we say CD into this project name that you just created, which is digital news app. Hit enter, and now you are in the directory. As you can see, this directory name has changed. CD means change directory. And then you just say code, period. And then you can open up this uh, application uh, inside your code editor. So what I'm going to do is to expand this so you can see it clearly. So now we are in the app, all right? So just briefly go through the, how the next.js works. The thing you need to look at is firstly the package.json file because the package.json file contains all the libraries and dependencies that have been installed um, for this project to work. So far, we have installed React, React DOM, and Next. And this is the script for you to start off or build this project. And later on, we're going to install more dependencies. And once you install a dependency, that name and version of the, of the dependency will be added into this dependency list. All right. So the next thing to look at is going to be the source folder. Inside the source folder, it contains the app folder. And here we have that uh, layout, which wraps the entire application. And here you can see on uh, the HTML tag, a language English, and inside a body, this is like the conventional way of writing the HTML um, page. And then the children part contains all the, all the code uh, for this application. It must be wrapped inside the children and put it inside a body. All right. So here is the dependencies uh, or the imports for this layout page. As you can see, we're we having this Google Fonts imported, which is the inter. Later on, we're going to uh, change it to uh, our uh, Google Fonts for this project. And also, you can change the metadata, which is the title and description of, the, of your website over here. All right? Just type in the thing you want. Actually, I'm going to do it right now. So we're saying this is going to be a digital uh, news uh, website or app because we are building a full stack thing. Uh, which is kind of cool. So we'll make the app. So this is um, the way that the set up the uh, metadata. And the next thing for you to look at is going to be the page. This is the home page of your application. So so far, it's um, giving us those default settings provided by uh, Next.js. If we open up the terminal inside our code editor by clicking on Control Backtick to open up this terminal, and we can see npm run dev, hit enter. And here you will have that thing um, um, create a new route on the local host of 3001 for you to load this project. Uh, the reason why it's not loading on the 3000 is because the 3000 is loading my um, completed project so far. So if you have nothing working or running on your 3000, your code should be working on 3000, hopefully, right? But now it's working on the 3001 for my new one. So just uh, control click on it. And then they'll take a couple of seconds to load that Next.js default page. All right? And then we're going to build everything upon this. And just close this off so, so far. 
and you can see this is a, a functional component as an import and image and a style and with all of those default settings we actually don't need any of these because we are building our own project so what I will do first is to delete all of these and inside the return I'm just gonna give a h1 tag by saying uh, digital news app so we have that name ready because we are not using these two imports I'm just going to remove those and now we have a pretty clean page right like this and if you're going back to our browser you will see that digital news app is there with only three words all the things the default setting has gone all right so that's that and the next thing I want to briefly cover is the node modules this node modules contains all the dependencies that have been installed or installed by default uh, with the next.js project you don't have to concern anything within this folder you just know the purpose of this uh, um, that's all yeah cool so now we are pretty much uh, ready to do the settings for this project the first thing is, is that we're going to update our package.json file by install few more dependencies so open up the terminal again leave the original one on and I want you to open up a new one so just click on the plus sign this is a brand new terminal and now we're going to install few more dependencies for us to do so we say npm install i for install so the first one is going to be the aos it's going to be animation on scroll to give us some scroll effect and we are using the bootstrap bootstrap and also we're going to use the bootstrap icon plural and uh, we're going to be building a full stack web so uh, probably going to have some environment variables to deal with the environment variables we're going to use a package called dot env so we say dot env like so and the next thing is because we are connecting to the mongodb so we'll be using a package called mongoose to help us with the connection to the database so we say mongoose mongoose and the next thing is that we have our header uh, which is swipeable slider so to handle that image carousel we're using a third party library called swiper and that's pretty much I can think of so far if we miss anything else I'll add it on later on but so far let's just hit enter to install all of these if there's no typo uh, it's going to install all of these dependencies real quick so now it's done and with the zero vulnerabilities as you can see um, if you close your package.json and just reopen it as you can see this thing gets updated with the AOS, the bootstrap, the bootstrap icon, .env, um, the mongoose and swiper with all the things comes in the alphabetic order um, that were just installed all right uh, please install this uh, before you start a project otherwise when you come to the stage and you missed out any of those you have to come back to the installation which is can be very time consuming all right once it's done we turn off the uh, terminal for now turn off the package.json file and now we are ready to build our project so to create this project firstly we're going to build some folders uh, to store our file and inside this source folder we're going to create a few more folders um, the first one is going to be we we'll create a new folder called the data but we probably kind of have some static data to use for this project and also inside the source we we'll create another folder called component because we need to have some reusable component uh, that can be used all across this application and the next one is going to be a section on the home page we do have some sections uh, for us to build so we have a sections folder and that's pretty much it yeah we have four folders inside a source folder only the app folder control the application the remaining three folders are just for supporting purpose all right so uh, because we are building this uh, full stack thing eventually I'm going to show you how to deploy it um, on Vercel so we are building a, uh, a full stack application with deployment so make sure that uh, you put your folder outside the app to make the code really clean and during the deployment proce uh, the process uh, if you set up your folder structure like this um, there will be a very high chance for success okay so that's the two folder and another two folder I want you to create right now is that at the very outside at the very outside so we create a folder called uh, config config because this folder will contain the file for us to do the database connection and all the settings another folder called models and this models folder is going to um, hold our data model so that's how the data structure will be like uh, what the data fields will 
well, we're gonna have uh, to talk with the database. Okay, so we have two more folder, and inside the public folder, what I'm going to do is to copy and paste in some static assets that we are going to use for this project. So what I'm going to do is just quickly uh, copy and paste in that assets folder. So inside this assets folder, it has an image folder IMG, and inside the image folder, it contains all of the uh, images we are going to use across this um, application. But don't you have to worry about this one? I will share this uh, uh, assets folder down the description link, so you can just use them straight away. Okay, so that's that. And now we are back to the source folder. Inside this app folder, uh, there's another folder we are going to build right now, which is the API folder. So we create a new folder inside the app. API. So this API folder is going to be used to hold our RESTful API, which is the backend endpoint. Okay. So that's pretty much the folder structure for the entire project. Uh, I have made this one very clear. And now to start to build, uh, we, we firstly we started from the home page. Uh, and then, if we're going to create any subcomponent, we're going to build those subcomponent later on, one by one. So, in terms of the home page, um, let's firstly look at the original um, project that I have built already. Um, the home page contains the banner section, um, which is a hero part. And then we're going to have this uh, a list of the newspaper of the news that has been contained in the card. So we're going to build uh, pretty much as two sections. The first section is the hero. Another one is the posts, and inside the posts has been designed, divided into four columns, and each column contains the news in a different format. Okay, and if you look at the entire application, at the very top is going to be the header, at the very bottom is going to be the footer. So this header and footer should show on every single page. As you can see, if I swap to another page, the footer and the header still shown. Okay, only the body of the page changes accordingly. Okay, so. Based that concept in mind, so we know that we're going to have a, a header component, and then for the home page, we're going to have a hero section and a post section. Okay, that's the basic structure we can comprehend so far. So back to our application, we know that this home page is going to wrap two sections. One is the hero, the other one is the posts. So what we say here, return, we'll create a main tag and give the ID of main like so. And inside here, we're going to have our uh, home, uh, our hero and the posts. And those two are supposed to be contained inside our section folder. So what we're going to do, go to the section folder, create a new file. The first one is going to be called hero TSX because we are using TypeScript. Enter. And then you say RFC to create a boilerplate like so. So we import a React and then we export this functional component. This shortcut will work uh, if you have installed this one. ES7 React Redux React Native Snippets. So if you haven't installed it, do it right now. And after you've done that, go back to your home page and you should be able to use this shortcut. Okay. So now we have that. And at the same time, we're going to have is uh, build another file, a new file called post, plural, TSX, enter RFC to have that boilerplate ready. So now we have two boilerplate, one for hero, one for post. That's going to hold two of our sections. And then we are back to the page, which is our home page. We we'll import those two. One is going to be the hero. Import that. Close off this angle bracket. And then below it, we're going to put our posts. And enter. Tab. So we we'll import that. So both the a hero and the post has been successfully imported over here. And now, if you're going back here, you will see that hero and post is there. It has been successfully loaded. All right. So. That means we have our two component or two section file ready to be served on the DOM. Okay. And the next job is going to think about on the home page, we still need a header and also the footer. Let's build the header first and then change the background color as well. There are some general settings that we need to do before we build the rest of the project. And one is going to be the CSS file. So far, if you're going to, let me close off this too. If you go into the layout, you will see the layout is currently importing this .global.css, uh, which is our global CSS file. And if you look at the file, it's over here. It tells the, the current settings for the default net.jx setting, right? But this is not what we want. So what I'm going to do is to delete all of this, and we end up with an empty file. And now if you're going back, you will see this one shows the, the white background, also with the paddings and margins on the corner. So, but our content is still there without any problem, right? 
So the next job is for us to uh, to create our own customized CSS for the global. And the first thing I'm going to do is to import some of the CSS variable files into this folder. So I'm going to be copy and paste. So I'm going to do paste. So now we have the variable CSS. So inside this, you will see all of those default settings, uh, all of those customized settings for our default font, default color, and everything. Right. So I will share this uh, variable CSS file with you as well. So you don't have to remember all of these if you want to code along with me. And also, uh, these are the settings to override some of the Bootstrap default setting. So say for example, we have the default Bootstrap color, and now we are overriding it with our customized color. So once you have all of these, uh, the colors and the style will be customized to our own purpose. Okay. I'll share this file with you uh, so you can uh, um, have a good understanding of all the variables. Now we have that. The next job is going to be our global file. So what I will do, I'll copy and paste in all of these CSS files. Again, I'm going to share this one with you as well. So I know that a lot of viewers have leave the comments that they cannot catch up the CSS uh, in the video. So don't you worry about it. Um, I will share uh, the most of the CSS, the complicated one with you, so you can have a good understanding. All right. So this one, I briefly explain it. Uh, for the root, we're going to make the scroll behavior smooth. So whenever you scroll up or scroll down, the page won't uh, have the jump effect. It will smoothly go to that position. And then we're going to remove the margin and padding of the page and make sure the box sizing border box. So we make sure that body have our um, predefined uh, primary color. Uh, this one has defined in our variable file over here. So we're going to use this uh, predefined variable color uh, for a setting. Font family as well. For the body scroll bar, uh, if you look at my project, it wouldn't show the scroll bar on the side. So that's because I removed it. Uh, well, somebody like the scroll bar. If you do like the scroll bar, just leave it on. And somebody like a clean page, which will make it look more fancy and elegant. If that's the scenario, you can remove it by using this code, display norm. Okay, the scroll bar will disappear. And for the anchor tag and anchor tag hover effects, we define it over here. And for all the H1 and to H6 title, we we'll make sure the font family will use our font primary font, which is also the variable that has been predefined over here. Okay, we set up the mar the, the main for the margin, and also for the, all the sections uh, you that you're gonna use or build across this app, we we'll make sure we have uh, uh, the sections, uh, paddings, the borders, and everything predefined. The page title. For each page we're going to build, we define the page titles looking over here, and also for the button. All right, just some um, general settings uh, for the CSS, and uh, that is going to be applied all through this application. Okay, so now we have these two because we have uh, used that variable file, we have to import it over here, otherwise it won't work. So we say variables. CSS, save it. So now you have that variable uh, imported before the global because the global is going to access some variable inside the variable.css file. The order must be correct. And now if you're going to the project, you will see that thing has been defined all correctly with a bit of a margin on the top because this bit is for us to build our header section. Okay. All right. And the next job uh, in the layout, what we're going to do is to change our font. And we know that we're not going to use this um, inter as a default font. And instead, what we're going to use is uh, a font called uh, uh, Garamond. So instead of this one, what we're going to do, delete inter, we say EB, this one here. We're going to use this font for this entire project. And then here, let's just create a new variable. Because we use the new font, this one must be the Garamond. And then we create a new variable called EB. Garamond. Okay, so now we have that thing gets imported, and to apply this font across the entire application, what we're going to do is to use the variable that we created here and access its class name property and apply it to the body. Okay, so that's how you can apply the Google Fonts to the entire application. Very very easy to set. Okay, that's that. And other things we're going to set before we start to create our component or section is some importations. Because we are using Bootstrap and Bootstrap icon, so what we're going to do is to import those settings over here. And also for this project, we are going to use the, the AOS animation on scroll. So we're going to import the animation on scroll over here as well, the CSS part. So 
So that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much the settings uh, for the entire project. So now the layout page has been done all good. If we're going back to the app, you will see the font size, the font has changed to the one that we has uh, predefined. Okay, it looks uh, not bad. And now the next job, uh, we're going to have to put a header here before we move on to the body. So what we're going to do is uh, go into our component, create a new file called header, .tsx, enter rfc to have that boilerplate ready. And then below that, we're going to create a new file called header.css, enter. So now we're trying to combine these two together by saying, oops, import query slash header.css. So now you have your CSS file imported into your component file. And for this header component, first we're going to import some hooks from the React. Uh, one is the use state hook. And because we are using the use state hook, that means there will be some state change on this component. And we are dealing with some user interactions. And if you think about it, the user interactions is quite obvious because whenever the user click on this uh, navigation button, it's supposed to take the user to that page. And also for this uh, zoom in glasses, if the user click on it, it there's supposed to be a search form that has been toggled. And click again, that thing goes away. So there's going to be some um, user interactions. And because of this, we're going to have to make this one a client component. In my previous videos, I have mentioned many times, you need to know the differences between a server component and a client component. And just pretty brief and simple, if there's going to be any user animations or interactions um, or state change, um, the component is more than likely to be a client component. If it's a static component without any interaction with a user, you can build it as a server component. All the component in Next.js um, was built by default as a server component unless you express this statement, otherwise it, it won't change it. All right. So this is the first thing we're going to do. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is to start to uh, create our component down here. Delete this one. And then inside here, we're going to create a header tag um, with the ID of header. So like so. Because we are using Bootstrap, we need to make sure this one is responsive. And so we can achieve so by using the Bootstrap class name. We give a customized class name called header. And then we'll make sure it's a display flex. So we say dflex. And we want to align item in the center, so we say align items center. And then we want this uh, navigation or the header part to be fixed to top. So we say fixed top. So this is all the bootstrap natural class. If you do this, you don't have to write a whole bunch of code in the CSS, which is very handy. Right, somebody asked me, can you show the project in Tailwind? I can. Later on, I will build a few more projects in a Tailwind. Um, but it, they all follow the same logic. It's a query system, column system. Uh, it's pretty much a, have a sim very similar class name, though. But I will build a few, few more projects in Tailwind and I show you how to handle those. All right. But so far, I will stick with Bootstrap. And we set up the uh, class name for the header. And the next thing is, uh, is going to be in a container. So we say everything must be wrapped inside a container. So we say container. And we want to make sure it's a container fluid because con the difference is between container and a container fluid is container fluid will take the whole width of the screen, while the container will leave um, some margin on both sides. That's the difference. So we say container fluid. And inside here, we say we're going to add a few more class names. Uh, say for example, we say a container. The large, and also we want to make sure it's a display flex, and we want to make sure the alignment of all the items uh, to be in the center, and also uh, justify content uh, bottom. Yeah, something like so. Oops, not bottom. We don't have that kind of a setting. Something like between. So that'll make sure our items are spread out. Okay. So now we have our container. And we make sure that uh, we take this uh, close tag. And inside the container, we're going to put in a whole lot of things. Have a look. We're going to have our logo and navigation 
and also this is a social icon and also the, the search form over here. So pretty much we have a full path or full component to be put in over here, right? So let's just do the first one, which is the social icon. We're going to build it as a anchor tag. So we say anchor tag with a class name of logo. It'll take us to the home page. And for the class name, um, we're going to do logo and also make sure it's a display flex as well. All the purpose of using the bootstrap uh, is pretty much to achieve that responsive design. Um, because these things is very time consuming uh, if you want to do it with the vanilla CSS. But with the bootstrap or tailwind, it helps us to achieve that. Center, right? So we have that done. And inside this anchor tag, I want to do an image over here. If you want to insert your brand image, you can do so. But for this one, for simplicity purpose, I'm just going to use a, a H1 um, to function as a logo. Okay, Digital News, give it a name. But if you do have an image source, you import your image source above as an object, and then you load it here. Okay, And now we have that one done. And the next thing for us to do is to think about, this is going to be our logo. And if you look at it, so far it's not showing. It's because we built the header component, but we haven't loaded on our page or haven't imported it somewhere. So what I'm going to do is to find a place to show this header component and to think about, are we going to show it on a home page or somewhere else? The problem is that if we import our header on the home page, it will disappear on other page, right? So the best position to load it is going to be our layout. Because if you look at this, this body wraps the children. The children refer to every dynamic page that we're going to build. So they're supposed to be the header above the children and the footer below the children to wrap the children. Okay. So the best place, we'll put it in over here, header. Import that right above successfully. And then if you're now going back, you will see that header is there. Okay. It looks quite nice and beautiful. All good. So what I'm going to do is to make sure this two CSS line gets loaded at the bottom. So it overrides everything before it. Reload it. Yep. So now we have our header. And then we're going back, we just continue our project. The next thing to build is going to be the navigation. So we're going to have to create a navigation that contains all the menu. And to do so, we create another component. We do not want to write the whole navigation over here, which is prolonged. Okay, Navigation has an isolated item, and it's reusable, hopefully, in the future. So we want to put it in the component folder, and we create a new file called nav.tsx. Enter. So here we say rfc to create a boilerplate. And then we're also going to have a CSS file for the navigation. So here I will create another file, nav.css. Alright, so we import that thing back here. Okay, so we have all the things done. Uh, to make things easier, I'm going to load the header CSS for now. Uh, otherwise, the page is going to look really ugly. So copy and paste in just a few lines of code. We'll make sure the header has a certain height and has a Z index really, really high. This one, it'll overlay all the remaining component with a decent background color F2 and also uh, has that logo. The logo H1 has been set preset to our de default color. Uh, for the image, I also have a uh, make the font and height. So if you do have your brand image, you can use it straight away. It has been controlled over here. Okay. So now if we're going back, you will see our header looks all decent with that uh, proper background. All good. Okay. So we close this off. And then the, the navigation we are going to build is right over here. And let's think about, do we going to build each list um, item manually code in this uh, post, create a post about contact? That's not the ideal way, right? So later on, if you want to change the name of your navigation, uh, you have to touch the code. So the perfect way to do so is going to separate the data and from the template, the UI template. So what we're going to do is inside the data folder, we created the data for the navigation. 
what I'm going to do is to copy and paste in the entire data for this project. It's not so much. Uh, one is for the navigation, the other one is for the social icon, and also the the hero section sliders. All right. I will share this data file with you uh, down the link in the description, so you don't have to worry about it. Just quickly go through for the navigation data. Each of them have an ID and a name and the link. This link will tell you where this navigation is going to take you to. And then we're gonna we're gonna have an active to make sure that uh, which navigation has been set active, which one is false, that kind of things. All right. So this is the data. Once we have it, we close it off. So the next job is to import our navigation data to this navigation component. Nav from the data file. All right. So now you have that thing imported, and then down here, we're just gonna write our code to create this navigation. In the return, we create a nav and give the ID, uh, call it the nav bar. And the same for the class name. We create a class name called the nav bar as well. And inside the nav, we're gonna do a list mapping. So we have a UL, which we're gonna create a list. And we want to map the data from the data file, which is the one that I just closed, this one, uh, into our list item. Okay, so quite simple. Whenever you want to write JavaScript inside a React project, you must wrap it with a curly braces. And now we say navs.map. Map is a JavaScript higher order array function that will allow you to do um, uh, repeating or simultaneously handling all of those uh, same behaviors or same events uh, to the data. Because we want to turn all the data into our list item UI template, this one allow you to do them all together really fast and quick. And inside here, we say nav. We're going to turn it into some HTML component. And that thing, we're going to do a list. And inside this list, we're going to contain it um, an anchor tag. Use that anchor tag to wrap everything. So inside this anchor tag, uh, we want to put in the name, nav.name. So what I, what I did here is we map the data inside the navs into a list item. And inside the list item, we have an anchor tag that will take the user, that will contain the nav's name, and also take the user to the place. All right. So here, the href is supposed to be um, the navs link, like so. And because we are doing the mapping, the React way for you to do the mapping is that you must assign a unique code, unique key, for each of the mapped item. So this one will be our nav ID. If you look at it, I have assigned ID to each of the nav, which is unique. Okay, so now we're supposed to have that navigation done. And what I want to do now is that instead of using this uh, anchor tag, I want to use a something called link, which is a building component in Next. Because the anchor tag, when you click on it, it will flink the page, it will reload the page. Right, but we do not want that reload effects to happen. And the proper way to solve this problem is to use something called link that will remove the reload e effect. So, and replace it with a link, and import it from the next. And you're gonna have to replace this one as well. So now everything has been wrapped inside our link. Let's test out if this navigation is working. So going back to our header, the next part is going to import our navigation below this anchor tag. And by the way, if you want to use the link for this anchor tag, that's going to be OK. And we're just going to import our nav over here. So now you can see the nav has been successfully imported. If we go in here, you can see the navigation is here. OK, now it looks pretty ugly because we haven't done a styling yet for the navigation. So if I go to the navigation.css file, and I'm just going to copy and paste all the code for the navigation, um, make sure you rearrange the paddings and you remove the bullet point for the list, um, give them the hover effects and focus effects, everything. So I just slowly scroll down all of these, all of these settings. And that's the design for the mobile view as well. Okay, to the end. I'll share all of these CSS files um, 
in the link down in the, in the description link. So don't you have to worry about it. So now we have that CSS done. And now if you're going back, you will see that thing looks much, much better. Okay. Now they have been spread out uh, to the two end of the page. That is because we only have two component. Once we build more, this one will be squeezed in. Okay. We have done our navigation. And compare with the original project, if you look at it, the first one is a home icon, not a home name. But now we are using the home name. How do we achieve that? It's just going to be a tiny change or modification in our component. We're going to do the conditional rendering here. First, we're going to ask if the navigation name equals to home. If the home, we show the icon. Otherwise, we show the name. All right. So here, we're just going to call this one. Inside the link, we do another JavaScript. We'll, ask, we'll be asking nav.name. We're using if that thing equals to a string home. We're using a ternary operator. If that thing equals to home, we're going to be using our icon. So we'll give it the i tag here. I'll put in the icon's name later on. Otherwise, I'll be using the nav's name. We don't need a curly braces now. OK, so how do we find the home icon? It's actually from the Bootstrap icon. So you don't have to manually type up. You just need to go to the Bootstrap icon website. Let me show you right now. So now we are in the Bootstrap icon. You just have to find this one. So if you go to icon, and here you just need to type in the one you want to search. Let's say home, and it will find it out. I choose this one, but you can choose any one you like. Just copy this one, and going back to your code editor, paste it in. Um, remember to change this class to class name, and that's all. Right. So we're doing the ternary operator. We're asking if the uh, navigation's name equals to home. If it's yes, we're showing the icon. Otherwise, we show the, uh, the string name straight away. Okay, so now if we're going back, you will see the icons there. Our navigation has been perfectly done. Okay, that's one part of it. Close this off, close the data off, and now we are back to the header. What's the next job? The next job is to create a header's right hand side. So, as you can observe in the original one, on the right hand side, we're going to have the social icons and also the zoom in glasses with the search box. So what I'm going to do is to create a new div to wrap up all the things on the right hand side. So we say div, give the class name, call it position relative, like so. And then inside here, we're going to include that social icon. So the social icon is supposed to be a separate component. We do not want to write everything on the same page. That'll make the page super prolonged and very hard to maintain. So what I'm going to do inside the component, I'll create a new file called SCI, stands for social. And dot tsx, enter, and then rfc to create a boilerplate. And at the same time, we create a new file called sci.css. And that is going to be the starting file. So we import our starting file back to um, our component folder, so like so. And now these two files are combined together. And inside this social component, we're going to do a bit of a data mapping. And let's, let's have a look of the data. In the data file, I have created this uh, social array that contains the kind of the social icons information with the ID, with the link. This link, of course, I uh, leave it blank um, by intention. So if you have your genuine social media link, you can put it in here. But so far, we're just going to use Facebook, Twitter X, and also Instagram. Okay. So once we have that, we're just going back to social to do a data mapping. But firstly, let's um, import the data, not over here. The data is going to be imported overhead. Here, we're just going to do the mapping template. So we say, um, create an empty angle brackets. And we're going to wrap everything inside here. So import that data, SCI, socials from data. So now it's ready. And inside SCI, map. So we're going to map it into each um, social icon element. And that is going to be a anchor tag. So we'll give the anchor tag. Um, instead of uh, showing the link, the link is going to be the social link. So we say SCI the link. Because as you, can, as you can observe, that each one will have the link property, which is access that one there. And we'll give this one a key. The key is supposed to be the ID. And also, um, we want to uh, 
have the target underscore blank. This one will allow you to open up the social link page on a separate page. Because when you browse um, the website, sometimes you click on the link, it'll remove your original web page and replace it with a new one that you just click on. But however, what I want to do is to open up the new page whenever the user click on the social media page and keep the old page stay. All right. So now we have that one. And the next thing is to give uh, a bit of a class name to handle it. So it's a class name. And X, um, that means that horizontal margin will give it a 2. The horizontal margin scales from um, 1 to 5. 5 is the maximum, so we'll give a bit of a margin not too big. And inside here, we we'll say span. And we'll give a class name. Social icon. Icon, yeah, so that'll do. And now we have that class name, uh, which enables the social icon to be shown. And we create a uh, anchor tag that contains the link ID and all the relevant class name. And we have done the data mapping. So each of the social icon will be mapped into this anchor tag template. All right. So that's pretty much it for the social. And once we've done that, we're going back to the header. And what I want to do is to import our social um, component over here. SCI, import it. If you save it. And now let's just go back to see. Yeah, as you can see, the social icon has been successfully presented on the browser. And our next job uh, is do the search form because we need to add a search form icon here. And then once we click on it, it'll, it should pop up with a search form. Okay, so back to our editor, we create another component inside the component folder and we call it a search form. .tsx. Enter RFC to have that boilerplate. Uh, we close off few of our um, previous. And now we are in the search form. And inside the search form, we're going to think about how do we design this component. First of all, this component is not supposed to appear on the DOM initially because this form is hidden. Only if the user click on the zoom in button, the form gets to show. All right. And once the user uh, hits the close button, the form disappear again. So that must be the click event to toggle on and off the form. Okay. So we must have some uh, status variable to handle this uh, appearance of the form. So inside here, I'm going to create some um, variables. We do an object structuring here. Remember that we're going to pass something, pass the property of the form inside the header and then handle the events inside the form. Okay. So the parents component will read the events and a child component will handle that event. Okay. So one is going to be the active status of the form. So we'll create a property called active. And the other one is that we're going to create a function which allow the user to toggle on and off of the form. And that function is called form open. Okay. So now we have these two. And then we're going to have to define the data type of these two because we are using TypeScript, which is a more accurate programming language. The active is going to be the Boolean, true or false and the form open um, and that one is going to be the object um, we're going to give a uh, a mixer type or any yeah so that'll make things work and inside this template we'll remove this one and we'll create our new one so here the first thing we're going to create a div inside this div it wraps our form so we'll create a form and give the class name called search form. All right. So this form does not have any action. So we remove this action property. And inside the form, we're going to create an icon, which is going to be a span. And that one is going to have the class name. Uh, we we'll call it icon search. So now we have that bootstrap icon to be shown. And down here, we're going to have that input box. And with a type of text, that's correct. And also on the placeholder, we say uh, search. That's no problem. And also we give a class name of form control. This is a bootstrap class name that will allow you to control this form uh, in a similar format of the form. So the input will be consistent. And below that, we're going to have that close button. So we say button. And we give it a class name. BTN. 
search close all right so and on click once we click on the close button it's supposed to make the search form disappear so we, here we call that form open this is the place where handle the click events however this form open the function we're not going to write a function inside a child component remember what i mentioned all the events must be raised in the parents component and to be handled inside a child component okay so that's the proper way of doing a react way and then down here we we'll just include that logo that icon so we say span and we we'll give the class name uh, call it the bix that's the close button so now we have everything done okay so how do we handle the appearance and the disappearance of the form this will only trigger the toggle on and off events but we need a css uh, class name to control it so here on the super parents div we give a class name and we're going to make this class name a javascript uh, by doing some ternary operator we conditionally render some class name so the css can handle it right give the back tick we're going to do some template string and then we say search form wrap so this is one of the uh, uh, bootstrap class name js search form wrap also the bootstrap class name and after that it's going to be our ternary expression so we say money sign double curly braces here you can say double check if this uh, form is on active status question mark if it's yes we're going to show a class name active and if it's not we're going to be undefined so in that way you know, oops i'm supposed to put this uh, javascript inside the back tick i put it outside be back and i add a new one here i remove it outside yeah, that has no problem now. So I explained again. These are the bootstrap static class name. You don't have to worry so much about it. The ternary operator uh, tells you if the class name is true, active status true, we're going to show the active class name. Otherwise, this thing will disappear. All right. So the active class name will be handled by the CSS of the form uh, to indicate whether it's visible or invisible. OK, so very quickly, what we're going to do is create a new file called search form dot css enter and then we link that thing back import period slash search form dot css so now i'm going to copy and paste in uh, my css setting i'll explain it to you so very simple thing we're going to make sure the form is positioned ab absolute and make sure it's on a, a top right corner um, visibility hidden just pay attention to this one. Initially, it's hidden with the opacity of zero. Basically, means it's transparent. All right. So, but however, if you scroll down over here, once the search form is on active over here, the search form wrap is on active class name. We're gonna turn on the visibility to visible and opacity to one. Okay. This is how we use the class name to control the DOM element. And here we just did a uh, a ternary operator to sh to show. Um, to conditionally show that active class name uh, depending on our state variable okay so now our child component is all done and our next job is going to be in the header to control this form and also create that form open function inside our header to raise that click events so going back here in the header uh, what we're going to do is firstly we're going to create a function and const we're going to use an arrow function and give it a name called uh, handle form open equals to like so so we create a uh, empty function and down here below that social i'm going to import our search form component so we import that one firstly we're going to create a local state variable called active we're going to pass in that one equals to something and then we're going to pass in that search form open and that one equals to the function that we just created all right two things two properties must be passed into the child component this is why the child component can take this two property um, by doing the object structuring and then use this two property over here okay so since we mentioned the local state variable we must create a, a new one by using the use state hook so over here we say const square brackets active so we must create that uh, local state variable 
or alternative we use another name open and set open that one equals to use state initially we do not want to show the a search form so we make a, a false value by default and this one equals to open okay so as soon as we change the status of the open either true or false this value will be passed to the active and active value will be taken over here it's all linked up and the next job is to finalize our open form function over here so we must be saying that uh, once the user click on the form um, the form will toggle this local state variable however because it's a form it's going to take some click events so we can must take that um, events or any if there's no events pass in and the first thing we're going to do is e dot prevent default to prevent any default click behavior prevent default and then the next thing is uh, set open to the opposite of current open status okay so if the current open status is true this one will be set to false if the false will be set to true that's how you handle the toggle events so now we have the function ready we have the local state variable ready all this thing has been passing at a property value to the child component the child component um, object is structured the property value over here and then applied in the template let's just try it out to see if it's working so going to our pro project yeah Oh, I see. I forgot one thing. Because we only created the form, the form is hidden by by default. We didn't put in the uh, zoom in glasses button. So above that form, we must put in that uh, button for the zoom in glass. So what I will do here is uh, create an anchor tag, another anchor tag, and inside here we create we delete that hyphen, and with a new class name, um, margin. Give it a margin on two side. So margin two, uh, js search open and then um, we bring that click events so we say on click we must have that on click events to toggle on the form and it's going to be using the same form handle form open and the other handle form open has been passed into the form itself which trigger the close events and inside here we just pass in that um, icon so we create a span with a class name uh, called search bi search this is the bootstrap icon so now we have that icon done which is the zoom in glasses and then the form is hidden up front once we toggle it on this one should show once we click the close button inside the form we toggle it off and now we're going back to the application we click on the form shows we click the, the cross button the form disappear all working correctly all right this is how you can handle the form inside of react.js and by the way this uh, research form is uh, reusable you can you can put it here and later on maybe you want to have a new place uh, to toggle on and off the new search form and also you can use it again okay so that's one of the the front end animation that we handled perfect so what's the next job the next job if you're looking at the navigation bar it's pretty much done with the the left hand the logo the middle side navigation and the right hand side social icon the search icon but if I turn on the mobile view as you can see there's no hamburger bar there even though when I turn on the mobile view that navigation disappear but there's no mobile um, view hamburger bar to trigger the navigation so what I'm going to do is to add on the hamburger uh, button here uh, so we can have the mobile navigation so we're going back to the editor and we create another function over here because we need a button to toggle on and off the navigation on the mobile view so we say um, const handle toggle menu and that one equals to which is another arrow function and we're going to create another state variable to handle the on and off of the menu on the mobile view and we call it on and set on and by the way this name is up to you however you want to name it I just want to make things simple so we say use state and same logic initially it's gonna be false because we do not want to show the mobile view navigation uh, when it's turned on but once the user click on the button the hamburger button at uh, the mobile views navigation should be shown so here we say 
set on to the opposite of on. It's quite simple. In that way, if the false, once we click on the button, trigger the function, it's going to be turned to true. If it's true, it's going to be changed to false. It's always going to the opposite direction. And the second thing, the bootstrap way of handling the appearance and the disappearance of the mobile view navigation is to add a class name to the body. Once that mobile class name add to the body, the navigation will show automatically. So let's just create one thing. So let body, we create a new variable called body. And that one is going to be a data type of HTML element. Let's see if I have that one. Element, yep, yeah. or any. And that one is going to we'll make a document query selector. This is the vanilla JavaScript query selector. We want to select the body. And once we have that body selected, we assign it to the body variable. We're going to do the class name toggle. So we say body dot class name list dot class list dot toggle. And we want to toggle on this class name, which is called mobile nav active. So once this class name gets added on the body, the navigation on the mobile view will appear. Once this class name got removed, the navigation will disappear. All right, so that's the logic. So now we have the function um, for the menu. The next job is just to create a button, the hamburger button on the mobile view to toggle on and off that function. So down here, um, below that, we create a, a JavaScript. We want to firstly asking if the mobile view is on or on or not. So we're going to say that if the menu is on or not by doing the ternary operator. So if it's on, we're going to do something. Otherwise, we're going to do another thing. So we created a ternary operator structure first. If it's on, what we're going to do is to show the hamburger button and also trigger the hamburger function. So we create a tag. And inside of here, I give the class name bi, bix, mobile nav toggle. And inside of here, we create an on click events to trigger that handle toggle events, like so. So that's one part. The other part, I'm just going to copy and paste this line because it's very similar, except that we're just going to change this one. Instead of the close button, we give the hamburger button. Other, everything else is supposed to be the same. So basically what it means, if the menu is on, basically means that on the mobile view, we have seen, uh, we are able to see the, the mobile navigation. Uh, we want to show the close button. And once the user click on it, uh, we're supposed to close the, the, man, the menu and also turn the uh, on to false. Otherwise, we want to show the hamburger button and also uh, create that toggle on and off function as well. So once it's done, we're going back to our app. We turn on the mobile view. Yeah, I just refresh the page. The hamburger button has been added on. If we click on it, as you can see, this navigation comes out. If I close the cross button again, this one disappear. So our navigation is now working perfectly on the mobile view. Okay, as you can see over here, I used a, uh, a red pen. As you can see over here, mobile act, mobile nav active. Okay, so that's the class name being added to the body. So once this class name added, the bootstrap will trigger the navigation for you straight away. You don't have to worry so much about it. Okay, so that's the logic. Let's close this out. Refresh. So now, up to now, we have done all the things inside the header, the logo, the navigation, the social icon, the search form, and also the mobile view as well. Next job, we are going to create our hero section and also the poster section. Let's just jump in and do it now. So to create a hero section, what we're first going to do is to create an environment for it. Firstly, I'm going to uh, link in some hooks. So the one that we're going to use the, is the use effect hook for this one. And because we are using the hook, it's going to be a client component. Anytime you want to have any user interactions with your DOM, so that's going to be make your component a client component. All right. And the second thing, the hero section, as you can see, the original contains this slider carousel, which contains the image data and also the text data. These data 
I have pre-built it inside our data array, which is this one, Hero Slides. Um, we build a hero section using this static data, but when it comes to the post information and all the uh, news, the cards, we're going to use the dynamic data from the uh, MongoDB database. All right. So I'll show you how to link in this uh, static data first. So the second thing, what we're going to do is to import the hero slide from the data file, and that's another one. And other than this, what I'm going to do is um, inside our section folder. We're going to create a new file called hero.css. So we need to have that CSS file linked in as well. Uh, period slash CSS. All right. So we have three things now. And the next one, I'm going to import some third party libraries. Um, one is that we're going to import uh, the LS animation on scroll. So because we do have some animation, when the user scroll the page, if I reload it, as you can see, this thing gets popped up. That's going to be a uh, animation on scroll um, effect. We're using this third party library. Because we have installed this AOS at the very beginning of the video, so we can import it. AOS from AOS, like so. You're probably going to see this underscore. Uh, this query line and tells you uh, the AOS has not been declared and ever read. The way to solve this problem is, is to uh, copy and paste this line. Just copy it. npm install save dev type AOS because we are using the TypeScript, not the JavaScript. If you're using JavaScript, you shouldn't encounter this problem. The TypeScript, uh, the TypeScript needs you to uh, declare the type of the things you imported. So the way to do so is to open up your terminal. This is the one that's holding our app. Don't touch that. In a brand new terminal, I clear this. Uh, you put in that line of code, and then you just hit enter. It'll install it for you. Yeah. So once it's installed, you can close it now. You can see that error line goes away. Okay. This is how you fix the error. And other than this, we're going to import a third-party library called a Swiper. So what I will do to make it easier is just to copy and paste all the Swiper stuff. First, the way in uh, you included the swiper and the swiper slide, and then we're including the swiper CSS file. We have the original CSS, the pagination, and also the navigation. And then last, we include the swiper modules file, which is the autoplay, pagination, and navigation. So there's quite a bit of an importation for this page. So once we've done all of this, we are ready to build the hero section. All right. So first thing we're gonna do is to use the uh, use effect hook to set up the uh, settings for the animation on scroll, like so. So we write the use effect hook, and then we initiate some um, properties and settings for the animation on scroll. Make the duration one second. Make the easing mode ease in out. Um, do you want to show the animation once? Uh, false. We want to show it multiple times. That basically means whenever the user make the scroll events, we're gonna show this animation. Do you want to have any mirror effect? False. Okay. So once we're done the settings for the animation on scroll, we're going to the component part over here. And then we we'll say I will create a section and give the section ID using that hash key. Uh, we call it hero slider tab. So now we have it. And at the same time, I are going to create a class name of the same thing, hero slider. So once we've done that, we we'll get into this. We we'll create a, a container. Uh, container hyphen middle. So we want a middle container, right? And we're going to do a data AOS. We're going to set the AOS data features. This one is going to be a feed in. So we say it's going to be a feed in. By the way, you can check the AOS website to see how many things you have. I'm just pick one. So this one going to be a feed in effect for this hero section. So once you've done that, we get into the, the hero section body and then we create a row. All the container must um, have the row inside it, or alternatively, all the rows must be wrapped by the container. This is the way the bootstrap works. Uh, the container wraps the row, the row wraps the column, and each row contains 12 columns. And by dividing the row into different parts of the column, you can um, decide the width of your, the different parts of your website. All right. So here we're going to create one row, and this row is going to contain 12 columns, which is the whole line. And inside it, I'm going to put in the swiper setting. So to create a swiper setting, you just angle brackets swiper. Uh, 
like so. Now you have that uh, swiper rider. Just uh, and inside the swiper rider, we can create uh, our slides. So the way the swiper works is that you must create a swiper wrapper first, and then inside it, we're going to have our, our different slides. And the next question is, where our slides come from? Our slides come from our slides data, right? So over here, we have our one, two, three, four, four image slides. So we're going to map this one because we have imported data into our hero file over here. We're going to map the hero slides data into our hero slide component. And that hero slide component is going to be the one that has been offered by the swiper react. OK, so here inside it, we're going to write a bit of a JavaScript like so. And we'll say hero slide dot map dot map is the uh, JavaScript higher order array function in ES6. It allows you to handle the data mapping sim simultaneously. Uh, it's very quick and efficient. And now you can have all the slides data mapped into your slide UI template. So inside here, we do a mapping slide arrow function parentheses. And inside here, we're going to in import that swiper slide component, close that off. And inside is going to be the actual hero slide we're going to build. OK, so we, we, we do have the customized slide template, but that template needs to be wrapped into the swiper slide. So here, what we're going to do is to, uh, I just leave a comment here for now, include customized hero slide template okay so we comment this one for now and now we have that template ready so what I'm going to do now is to build that customizer hero slide and inject it into our swiper slides okay so back to our component folder create a new file called hero slide dot TSX RFC we have the boilerplate ready and also what you want to do is inside the slide, we're going to think about um, what does the slide contain, right? If you look at the original one, each slide should contain a background image, a title, and a brief discussion or a brief introduction, all right? So it's a three information point. And let's just double check in our data file, we have that background image, the title, and a brief ready. So we're going to have this three property, object destructed, into our hero slide. So here we'll say we import our slide object and to define it, each slide we must contain, give it a new line. One is the B BG image, stands for background image, and that data type is going to be a string. And the next line we're gonna have the title, oops, and that one is going to be a string as well. And we're gonna have the brief. And that one is going to be a string as well. So now we have that slide object passed in as a property to the child component, and we define the, type, the data type of it. So for the template body, we delete this one. We're going to use a anchor tag to wrap everything up. So we say anchor tag, and we want a uh, have a, a class name image bg. That's all. And for the link, currently I just put in. Um, a hash key there. So if you have a, a genuine link to that page, you can put it in later on. But so far, let's just leave the hash key. And for the class name, I want to make sure it's a, a, a flexible design. So we say d hyphen flex, that's display flex in CSS. And then align items end. So we want to align everything to the end. Okay. So that's one more thing. Well, so once we've done that, the next part is going to give a um, in-text styling. Instead of doing the style on a CSS page, I'm just going to show you how to do an in-text styling in a React project on the next project. First, we create a style, and that one is going to be a JavaScript. We wrap everything with a JavaScript object. And because the CSS comes in a key value pair format, the same thing happens here. You have to create a JavaScript object to define a CSS setting. It also comes in a key value pair. So the key is going to be the CSS property. We say uh, background background image. So we have that property ready. And then colon, the next one is going to be the URL of the image. So we say backtick doing the template literal URL. 
and then we're just going to show that URL of that uh, image, which is going to be slash money sign double curly braces, and we say slide dot background image because the, the rest of the background image has been predefined in our data file. So now we can access it over here. Okay, that's how you can do the in text styling uh, in React project. And inside the anchor tag, what we're going to do uh, is to create another a div and give the class name image bg in uh, like so. And inside it, we're going to have a title, and that's going to be slide.title. And the next line, we're going to have a paragraph uh, to hold our brief discussion or description. We say slide dot brief like so so now we have all the data points injected into our ui template the image the title and the brief okay so we've done our hero slide part and back to our hero we know that here we should inject our hero slide ui template so we say hero slide get it included and you can see this uh, curvy arrow line down the bottom that is because we here we define all the settings but we didn't pass in that as a property value. So we must say slide equals to the slide itself. All right. So this slide refers to the slide that has been mapped in the data. This slide is the property that has been passed in as a, a, as a property into our child component. All linked up. All right. So now we have set up our swiper and also the slides. Um, if we just go back here, as you can see, refresh the page. It is there with... Um, if I swipe it, it's also going to work. And also, if I reload the page, you will see this zoom in effect, this fade in effect is working for the animation on scroll. However, the size of the banner is, isn't correct. If you look at the original one, it takes up probably half the screen in terms of the height. So, what is the problem? The problem is that we only create a swiper, but we didn't define the swiper's property value. There's a heap of things we need to define here before we can make it look properly. So, what I'm going to do is to quickly copy and paste my define over here and I'll explain it to you we're going to make sure that the slide per view is auto I pretty much it's going to be depending on the screen size the speed is going to be half second uh, for each slide to show it's going to auto play and also the patternation we're going to create a patternation with a class name of swiper patternation we're going to create a the swiper button to trigger that um, next one and the previous one events and also, we're going to include all the module we have used, which is the autoplay, patternation, and, and the navigation. Do you want the slide to be loop itself? Yes, we do. And also, we can give the customized class name to our swiper. All right. So once we've done that, the last but not least thing is to put in our settings for the arrow button, the navigation button, and also the settings for our patternation. So I put in these two. Here, we're going to have our customized swiper button next. I customized the swiper button previous and also our patternation. All of this class name, the class name here and this one, must match the one you defined over here for this project to work. If they have any inconsistency, the error button, um, the navigation button, and the patternation won't be work as, proper, as you think. Okay, once we've done that, we're going back and we reload it. And now you can see that patternation is there, it's appearing. And also the next one, the previous one, it's all working if you click on it. But somebody mentioned that the height of the banner is still incorrect. Of course, because we only set up the template for the swiper, but we haven't touched on the hero CSS. All the layout and looking is supposed to be handled by the CSS file. So what I'm going to do is uh, go to that hero CSS file. I'm going to copy and paste in all the settings for you. And by the way, for this project, for someone who wants to code along with me and make it easier for you, uh, I'm going to share all the CSS code uh, down the link in the description. So you only need to follow me along for the TypeScript code. You don't have to worry so much about the CSS code, right? And the reason why we why I don't type up every single letter during the course is because first, it's time consuming. Second, um, it's a very standard CSS. Um, for someone with some basic understanding of web development should be able to uh, comprehend this straight away. So I'm just going to briefly go through the CSS and hopefully you can get it. For the background image, we want to make sure the height is 500 pixels. Once you have that, that will extend the height. All right? We want to make sure the background size is covered, everything looks correct. And also, on different screen, we're going to 
just the height of the background image as well. And we're going to create a pseudo element before, which is like a cover shade on top of that image. And then for the background inner, we'll make sure the position is relative, give them a certain paddings and margins. Everything else should be fine now. Okay, so that's the control for the button. That's the control for the navigation button as well. We give them a certain color. And that's the control for the navigation bullet point. We give them a certain color as well. All right, so quite a standard definition. So now let's go back to see. Wow, as you could see, this one gets fitted in. And then when, if you swipe it, it's working. The navigation button is working. And also the bullet point is also clickable. If you click on it, it'll take you to that specific slide. All right, so everything now looks beautiful. This is really, really cool. It's like a, we're building a, a, a digital newspaper website that will allow the user to see all the headlines, the training information, and the shocking news around the world. Okay, so the hero section has now been completed. Next, we're going to build our post section. In that section, we're going to set up our connection to the MongoDB database and to start with our RESTful API endpoint. Let's just jump in and do it now. So to create a post section, before we build the actual component, we're going to make sure the environment is all ready. So just double check that you have this folder set up. What is the config folder? Because we're going to set up our database connection to MongoDB over here. And then we're going to build our data model in the model folder. And also make sure you have that API folder inside your app. And because we're going to make an API endpoint over here. And then you go to your package.json. Package.json file, just double check you have installed this .env file and also this mongoose file because we're going to use this too to build our backend. All right. This is a genuine full stack website. So first thing first, uh, I want you to create at a very outside level a file called a new file called a .env. Right. Enter. So this one will be used to store our environment variable. Um, during the web development process, some of the variables are environment variables. These variables are not supposed to be stored anywhere in your document. Otherwise, the hackers or anybody can see it. If we put it into the environment variables, it's hidden under the hood. All right? So nobody can see it. Say, for example, some, something like your password, uh, your database password, your database routes or URL, uh, or your token key. Those things are very confidential information. They are supposed to be stored as an environment variable instead of a you put it directly into your document file. Okay, so we use this file to store our MongoDB URL, which is going to be the confidential data. That's the first step. The second step, I want you to make sure that you can access your MongoDB web page. This is the Atlas MongoDB. Uh, you, if you haven't got an account, you need to create one, or you can use your Google account uh, to log in straight away. And then the third thing is that we're going we're gonna to use something called a Postman, uh, Postman to make a uh, request to the back end before we even build the front end. All right. So what you need to do is to go to Google and type in Postman and download that application and install it. And then you can open up the software on your browser. All right. This will allow you to create a post request, get request, get a single request, a delete request, and a put request to the back end without even having a UI front end. Okay. So that's a couple of things we're going to be need for today's project. And the next job is going to log into your MongoDB website. So what I'm going to do is to log in because I already have an account. Um, I don't have to uh, create another one. So I'm just going to using my existing one. So just wait and be waiting for a second for it to log in. So once you log in, you need to create your own profiles and your project name or your company name, whatever. But this, this page will show you all the projects you currently have. Um, as you can see, I already have one uh, project for the digital news app, which is the one I'm currently using. But to demonstrate you how to do that, I'm going to create another one. So we, here on the button top corner, we create a new project and name the new project. Um, I'm just going to give it another name and call it a digital uh, news. Let's say web. Right, we change the words. So this project is going to call the Digital News Web. And <clears throat> here they, they want you to ask, do you want to add in any key and value tags? So currently we have fun. We're just doing a simple project demonstration. You don't have to worry so much about the tag because this is optional. So what I will do is next. And then it's going to ask you the project owner, which is me. That's going to be correct. If you do have any team members, you can add in over here. But so far, just me. 
and then we we'll create a project so now we have our, already have our project right so the next job you can go to deployment and here's on the sidebar I had a lot of things for you to look at you can have your database which is the one we're going to use and we can build a database over here later on so let's just say try to build a database and now they give you the options um, what kind of database you want you can have that uh, uh, the payment one or the, the free one because we are doing the demonstration purpose a sample project um, there's no need to pay any money so we just choose the free one and that space is sufficient to hold our small data and then you just have to create a, a name uh, for your um, application let's just say we want it to be digital news um, data something like that so we're using Amazon the region is going to be in Sydney um, based in Australia uh, but really depending on your own location it automatically identify your own location so you don't have to worry so much about that so once you have this you just create a deployment and that'll give you a username and also a password so what I want to do is uh, this password looks pretty long and I'm just probably going to create a let's see if I can change it nope show just going to copy that copy the database user once we have that open up your editor in your environment variable we paste it in that password there because later on we might use it and that's going to be okay or alternatively uh, let's just use that one create a user yep and the current IP address is my IP address but we have to change it later on but uh, now it asks you to choose your connection method and we are building this one from our, our Visual Studio Code, VS Code, MongoDB for VS Code. So we choose this one. And now you will have your Mongo URL, like so. This one. So what you're going to do is to copy this route. This one indicates show passwords, the password is shown. If you close it off, you have to manually fill it in. But uh, we are using a random password anyway, so um, that's going to be okay. Don't try to connect my routes, create your own routes, because I'm going to delete this database uh, soon after the tutorial, okay? So once we've done that, we copy this one, we go to the .env file that we just created, and we create an um, environment variable called Mongo URL, and that one equals to this one. So you just copy that in, and just double check the password is the same, and that's going to be okay, all right? So that's it. And after the .NET, we probably want to create a, another extension. We want this to have a, a database model to hold our data. And we say that's going to be digital hyphen news. Yep, something like that. It'll be OK. And after that, whenever we inject the data into our database, it automatically create a, like a model inside our database uh, to hold our data, to hold our records. All right. So that's the thing you need to put into your .env file. So now we have done this one. You can review it and done. Okay. So that's pretty much it. All the things have been done correctly. And then if you click on your database, as you can see, the database is there. If you want to change anything, you can go to the connect again. That will allow you to fetch this information again. Right. So it's quite simple. And if you want to browse your connect collections, the collection is your database. You just click on this button. And then we get into the database we just created, uh, which is going to be the digital news data. So far, it's showing some sample data, but it's not relevant to us. So once we create a uh, our own database, which is the, the one that I just mentioned, digital news inside our database project, this one, uh, it will give us a brand new database, which is empty. Okay, so that's that. Another thing I wanted to look at is the network access. So far, this database is only allowing your own IP address to access it, which is the one point something, right? 
but we wanted things to be accessed anywhere, even from the remote server, because eventually, once we build this project, I'm going to deploy it to a genuine server online. Okay, so the best way to do so is we change this one to any place, then that is going to be 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 slash 0. That'll indicate this one um, is allowed access from anywhere. So we confirm that. It's going to be pending for a while. But once it's done, your database should be ready to go. If you, this, this step is very important. If you do not change the network access, pretty much it means you, only your local host can access this database. Any remote servers or other places, will, the, the database will deny the access. Okay. So we have the network access. This is the database access, which is your own self. You, you are the user and you know the password. Uh, so now we're all good. Cool. So the MongoDB is done. So once it's done, we're going back to our code editor uh, and make sure that you have the Mongo URL stored in a .env file and we close that off. The next thing to do is to set up our MongoDB database connection in our config file. So what I will do is inside the config file, we create a new file. Sorry, inside the config folder, we create a new file called db.ts. And here, we're just going to import our mongoose because we are using mongoose to connect to this database. And we write a database connection function. We say uh, connect the db connect. And that is going to be a synchronous function because we're handling a synchronous behavior. Once you talk to the database, the response is not going to come back immediately. It's going to take a while depending on the location and the internet speed, right? So we're going to have to write a asynchronous function and do the try catch error block inside of here. So we say try catch. We try to catch the MongoDB basically saying await mongoose.connect. Here you just need to pass in the the connection URL <clears throat> and the connection URL has been set in our .env file here but we do not want to copy again because this one is supposed to be stored as the variable mongo URL inside the .env file so to access that environment variable we say process.env.mongo underscore URL that's all something like that all right so in this way we'll try to connect to the URL and if it's successful we just console.log by saying uh, we say connected to MongoDB success right so something like that but uh, if we catch any errors we just say I just copy this line and by saying that connect to MongoDB failed. And we say process.exit1. That basically means that we're going to jump out of the entire process. Okay. So once we have that function, we're just going to export it. So export default db connection. So now this function gets exported from this file. Basically means that it can be used in any other files as long as you import it. Right, this is a database connection file. So done that, and in the model, we're gonna do our second thing, which is to create our uh, post item because we are making a lot of a post in this project. So we're just gonna have to create our post item model inside the model file. So here we say a new file, a new file, and we call it post item .ts. Enter. So again, inside here we're still gonna use the mongoose. Mongoose is to use to handle the MongoDB language. It's the same like the when you use the SQL, you have to use the SQL language to connect to MySQL or Postgres or any SQL based database, right? So we are, because we are using MongoDB, supposedly we should write the original MongoDB database language, but that is going to be very time consuming and inconvenient. So Mongoose will serve as a some, something like a middleware that will make the process easy and make the query easy as well. So we say Mongoose again, import that from the mongoose and here we're just going to create a schema uh, for our model so we see const post item schema equals to new mongoose dot schema something like that we wrap everything in a parenthesis 
So here, what we're going to do is to define the fields and the properties of our data. So it's the same like the relational database, you must have different fields. So for example, you will have the ID property for each data, for each model that you're trying to set up. And you'll probably say, for example, if it's a user, you're going to have the user name, the user email, uh, the user address, something like that. So we're creating the post item, we're supposed to have an ID, the image, uh, maybe uh, the image of the post, maybe the date of the post, the title, um, the description, the author of the post, a category of the post, something like that. We just have to de define those uh, fields inside the schema, right? This will control the data structure to make sure that every single data that gets injected into our database follows the rules of the schema. Otherwise, people will just create random stuff and uh, make the post request to your database, and it turns out your post will be very inconsistent in the end. Okay, so what we're first gonna do is to define the schema. What we're gonna have, uh, one is going to be the image. The image is going to be the, the route of our um, post image. Like, like you can see in the original project, each one, each post will contain an image on the top. This image, we have to put in the routes in the database. Somebody always confused that, um, do we put the image itself in a database or something else? No, the database only store the root of the image, which is the URL. The image itself is supposed to be uploaded in the online cloud drive. Say for example, you're using the Amazon S3 bucket, the image itself is supposed to be uploaded into the Amazon S3 bucket. And the image route or the URL is supposed to be stored in the MongoDB database. So whenever we get a GET request to fetch the image, we actually fetch the image routes. And image routes will refer to the S3 bucket and then eventually fetch the image. All right, so that's the process. We do not store the image itself into MongoDB. That's impossible. So we say that image we want to type to be uh, a string because we're, we're storing a routes and it's going to be required. Some of the property is going to be compulsory. We cannot avoid it. If that's a situation, you just say it's a required equals to true, okay? And the second one, we say we want a category, a category, and that one, the type, is also going to be a string. And if it's required or not, yeah, I think so. Each post should have a compulsory category and date, which is the date that item has been inserted. So we say the type, the MongoDB has the data type for date. And we want to have a default value because the, when the user create a post, it's supposed to be created on the day when the post request was made, right? So the user doesn't have to choose a date to make the post. So we say by default, um, we want this thing to be date.now, not new. So in this way, it'll always be the most current time the user created data. And we want a title for each post. And a title will have a type of string. And also if it's required. And that is going to be true. That one is done. And the next one, we want to have a brief of that uh, article. Well, how you set up the data schema, it's up to you. If you feel that my settings is not going to be perfect or not satisfying you need, you can adjust it yourself. But you learn a strategy from me, okay? And the brief, we wanted to have a type of string as well. Pretty much most of the things that we store are string. And any other kind is like a data or boolean. Some of the, these things can be used as well, but the database is used to store a string message. Uh, if it's required, um, not necessarily, maybe some article does not need a brief, so we just give a default value to be null, basically means nothing. And avatar, avatar basically means uh, sometimes the user has the avatar, the user who makes the article might have an avatar, and we want to store that in the database as well. For this project, I, I'm trying to make it simple because I want to show you the crowd how to make the CRUD, the, the create, the update, the delete, and put requests to, to the backend. Um, so we only have one model, and later on, in a future project, we may create a complicated project. We probably can create a multiple model, and how to set up connections with them. I will also show you in a future project. So this one, type, 
we're going to make it a string and default it's going to be null because not every author is going to have an avatar some of them just don't have it it's okay and the next thing to do avatar uh, author name so we say author that one is going to be type string and uh, default no if the author choose to keep the post anonymous that's going to be okay and we have a two more setting if it's going to be top news or trending news because depending on the level of the news maybe the newspaper want to put it into different place I want to show it in the, in the front page I want to show it in the corner right so we have to make sure that uh, we give it a uh, a boolean type and default it's going to be false so by default all the news are standard news not the top news and not a, not the trending news okay but uh, if you want to set it to true specifically you can do so when you make the post request and then we create another property called trending and the type is also going to be in a boolean with a default a false okay so now we have everything ready so we're up to here and after this outside of the purple curly braces I want to create another one so this is the MongoDB setting do you want a timestamp uh, to be inserted into the database yes we do because we are creating this uh, post line item uh, we need to know the time that post has been made and deleted or changed right so here we save a timestamp and we set it up to true okay all done so now that's gonna be our post item schema so once we've done that we have to apply the schema to our database so our next job is to connect the mongoose and apply this uh, model so we say const we create a post item uh, oops I just can't type right now post item double equals to a mongoose mongoose dot models first we're going to check if the post model has existed or not only the first time you post the data it will create this model in the database the next time you will use the existing model right so it will either be using the model dot post item if that exists we're going to use it straight away alternatively we're going to create this model so we say mongoose dot model inside here post item and we want to apply the post item schema like so right that's all the last job because we have created our model we have to export it otherwise no one can use it so we say export default and postman post item sorry not postman uh, so now just review the file we have, we have just uh, built so we create a schema for the post item all of the features uh, including the timestamp and then we create that post item model we double check um, if there's no such model we create a model applying the previous schema above and if there's a post item model we're just going to apply the model straight away okay so that's the code so we've done a database we've done this post item and then we are now ready to use our uh, API folder to create our restable API endpoint so all the backend must be built before we can write any code over here at least we have to build maybe one or two routes for the backend and we go to the API folder uh, we, inside here we create a new folder called the post items you can name it anything you want and once we've done that inside the post items we create a file called root Dot TS. So this one will be used to handle the rules for the postman. So in the end, you will have an uh, endpoint, uh, something like localhost 3001 slash API slash postman, and then you can make the request on that route. That's going to be your endpoint route. So inside this root file, what we're going to do, <coughs> we're going to connect our database and make the get request or post request here. Okay, we write two routes here. So firstly, we're going to import our database, our DB connection from our config folder. And then we're going to import our post module 
from our module folder. So first, we're going to write our get request. Uh, before that, we're just uh, going to say db. We call this function. So once you call this function, your database will be connected. Once it's connected, we're going to write our um, routes. So we say async function, like so. So the first one is going to be get. This is a get all request. So once we make this request, we're going to fetch all the items stored in our database. So, and we're going to say that uh, const we create a item called uh, okay the variable called post items. We're going to await our post item to find this is the MongoDB language everything. But um, I show you one example of my previous job. In this one, this is the, the current database we are using for this newspaper website. If I go to database, go to browse connection, I show you what the data looks like when it's eventually in a database. It'll have an ID, underscore ID, and also you will have that under, un, double underscore version. So when we fetch data from database, we probably don't want to include this version in the response. Okay, so we must remove it. Remaining stuffs are useful. We want to keep them. So what I will do, back to the editor, we say select give a string minus means delete and double underscore v. So we do not want to select that one. This is what it means. Okay, so and in total, this expression means I want to go to the Postman module in the MongoDB database, the one that we have set up, to find everything we have uh, except the property of the double underscore version. So once we have that, we're going to return this response in a JSON format. So we say response.json post items. That's all. That's how you can make the get request, a get all request from the MongoDB. All right. But so far, we couldn't test it out because we haven't got anything yet. And what I will do is that I will make the post request before we can test it out. So I will write a, a route for the post, async function. And we say this is going to be a post. In a post, we're going to have some parameters here. So we say we're going to take the request from the user of the body request. And the data type is going to be request as well. It's going to be a request object. <coughs> Excuse me. And then once we get the request, we want to convert it into a JavaScript array um, that contains the JavaScript object. So we say postman, create a variable, a post item, equals to await request.json, like so. And then we try to insert these things into our database. So we, we use a try catch block over here. In the try, we, tr we create a new variable called the saved item. And that one equals to await new post item. So the way to save the new post item is to copy everything we have in our current post item because we want to create a new one by applying the post item model. So we say dot 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 post item. This syntax is called a spread operator. The spread operator pretty much means copy, right? We want to copy everything we have in the post item. And then we say dot save. This is the MongoDB language. So once we saved it, the database should have our item. And then we have to make the response to the user. We create a new response. And in the new response, we're going to say json.stringify because we want to return the saved item um, as a JSON format on the DOM. So we say JSON stringify saved item. And then inside the curly braces, we're going to set up the headers detail. So headers. Inside here, we're going to say uh, content type hyphen type and that is going to be application slash JSON like so and then below that if it's success 
we want to show status and that is going to be a 201 that's all right so this is how you can make the post request when you make the post request the difference is you must set up the header information tell them that this is going to be the JSON format data to be posted into our database and if we catch any errors so what we're going to do it's also going to return a new response in a JSON format so we say <coughs> response and inside here it's going to be JSON dot stringify inside here we put a, a JavaScript object but this JavaScript object will be converted into JSON and we say uh, message uh, server error so server error and after that we're just going to give a new status code because we have a server error we will say status uh, 500 basically means there's something wrong with this database we couldn't make be able to make the post all right uh, let's see what's the problem here oops oh, this thing must be wrapped inside the curly braces my bad yeah that's all so now we have all of these things done. So that's our post request and that's our get request. Uh, finger crossed, let's try it out on our postman to make a, a, our first post request to see if it works. So we jump into our postman and you create a, a post request over here. And inside the role, you choose JSON, right? This will create you an empty JSON template. And you just need to make sure you have the correct routes. The routes is localhost 3001 because our current project is under 3001. If you're under 3000, you just type in 3000. Yeah, because I'm running two applications at the same time. The first one has used the 3000, so the second one must be using the 3001. This is the reason. And why do I know that routes structure? Because this is going to be app slash API slash postman. The beauty with next.js is that inside your structure of folder is going to be your routes. The app is the root, all right? Slash API slash post items. And then you will find this get request and post request. That's quite simple. Okay. So what I will do next is that I will try our first uh, data in a JSON format, something like so. I copy and paste in one of the JSON data. This is going to be our image routes. This is going to be the category, the title, the brief, the avatar, and author's name. It is going to be a top news. That's true. I set it to true specifically. It is going to be a trending news, false. Okay. So now let's just try it out. Send. Sending request. Yep, we get a response with a status of 201 credit. So that looks all good. And this is the response that we have get. Uh, we have the images, we have the categories, everything has come back from the database, including the ID. Perfect. So let's now go to our database. I want to go to our, our new database that we just created, which is the digital news web. And I will jump into it. We go to database and then browse collection. Inside here, you should have a new database created, Digital News. The reason why you have this branch is because in your editor, remember the .env file, after we created the routes for the API, for the database connection, we add our branch name, Digital News, after the slash. This is why you can have it, okay? Because you might have uh, different modules. That's why you need a, a branch to wrap everything up. And the post items, just pay attention to the name. This one is determined by when you create a module. This one, module post item, right? The name must be exactly the same. That's how it works. And then we inserted our first item, which is this one. And that's the from the post request with the credit time and updated time and a, a date time. Okay, so that's how you get it. First one. Since we have made a post request, let's just try to get all requests. It's the same thing. You don't have to touch anything. Just put in the routes, uh, which is a local holder 3001 slash API slash postman. And then we make the get request to that routes. We send. Perfect. We have successfully fetched the data from the database with only item listed. If we try this out on the browser, it should be also working. Let me try it out. So here in the browser, I type in this URL, local host 3001 slash API slash postman. And we get this one as a return. Okay, this is the, the same thing as we can see from the postman. 
okay so now our route is working and uh, next job is for us to build the post uh, page uh, we haven't finalized all of our rules yet because we need a um, a delete request we need a get single request we also need a uh, um, the update request which is a put request but so far we are good with these two routes one is the the get all the other one is the post we are okay to create our post page because the post page is just a list of all the items that we have which is going to be okay but once you click on it it should take you to the get a single page okay so let's just build our post page for now back to the editor close this one close this one close this one if you opened up your terminal and go to go there you will see this connect to mongodb success that basically means that our connection is good okay and we opened up the post and we probably want to create a starting file for it as well later on it's gonna make things a lot easier so we say posts CSS and we're gonna put this thing back uh, here we slash posts dot CSS all good so inside the component page firstly I'm going to create uh, import few hooks one is the use state hook the other one is the use effect hook and above that because we use that state management thing we have to make this one a client component so we say use client and other than that also I'm going to import the use route from the next navigation and yeah that's pretty much we are good so far and for the post itself because we use that use router hook we have to set up the route this will allow you to go to different routes if, when it's necessary so we say router equals to use route yeah that's all close brackets and we have to set up uh, the local state variables to hold the items that we fetched from the backend endpoint so we say items set items That one equals to use state. And initially, we want it to be an empty array. And we have to define a name. Uh, just going to say it's going to be any, the data type, or an empty array, like so. And that looks good to me. <clears throat> and below that, I'm going to write a function to get a data. So we say const uh, get items data which is going to be an arrow function equals to so we use that fetch method which is the JavaScript building method to get data from the backend and it's going to be slash API uh, slash post items yep. um, if we can fetch data that will return us with a promise and then we have to consume that promise so we say response response.json to convert it into JavaScript and then once it's in JavaScript we're gonna have to set our local state variable to the JSON data that we fetched from the backend so we say then data set items equals to data if we oops if we catch any errors during the process what we're gonna do it's just a console.log.error so far e.message like so so here is our get item data um, method and we have to call this method whenever the post component gets mounted on the DOM so we say use effect and inside here the way to use effect hook is that we need to put in uh, an error function and use that arrow function to trigger whatever you want to trigger when this component gets mounted so we say get item data we trigger that function so the use effect hook will call this function the data will be fetched and then it will be mapped later on uh, it pops up with an error let's see what's going on yeah I double save that file and the error goes away it looks all okay for me 
So, so far, we have pretty much uh, triggered this function. And to see if this thing is going to be working, what I will do, I'll inside this one, return. So, so far, let's just uh, create a template to test it out um, instead of writing anything. So, we create a section and give the section ID, um, hash key, uh, posts, and also the class name posts as well. So inside here, uh, we want to have in a container. Um, what else? We're going to have a data uh, AOS. We're going to have an animation on scroll effect. So this one is going to be in a fade up. And inside the container, we're just going to do a testing um, of that items. So we say items it's going to be JavaScript, items, and items dot length greater than zero, and items dot map item. We map, we map that item into, let's just say, make it simple, uh, a paragraph. with the item.title, oops, something like so. So in this way, we're just probably going to need an item.title for this one. And we, here we have to define a data type. And we have to say items we need, let's see what, which one we need. We need item, colon, uh, title. And that one is going to be a string. So now we can have the access to the item title. And we must assign a key as well. So it's a key equals to item dot underscore ID. So here we must have that ID as well, which is going to be another string. Yep, all set. So let's see if this thing's working. So we're going to our post page. Here we go. So we can have now successfully load the, the titles page on our DOM. Okay, that the page of the post item on our DOM. But so far we only have one item in the database. If you look at it, we only have one item. So what I'm going to do is that in our post request, I'm going to post a few more stuff. I have actually uh, uh, stored all the post item data in a JSON file. <clears throat> so at the end of the tutorial, I'll share that JSON format data with you um, down the link in the description so you can post it straight away. You don't have to manually key in this world. But so far, let me just uh, try another one. So remove this one in the body and I put in another one and I make a post request. It comes back. If we go into our database, here we have the refresh button. So once we refreshed it, and now you can see we have two things there. If we go into our DOM, we reload, reload it, and now we have two things there. Beautiful. Okay. So we know how the things work, but um, presenting the title of the, the of the post item is not the final solution because we want to present a whole bunch of stuff like this. So we're going to have to create a template to hold the cards, right? A template cards to hold our post item. And let's have a look. All the cards follow the same sort of a format. One is the profile image, a title, and a brief discussion. And for small cards, the, the brief is going to be removed away. And the same for the avatar and the author's name. So our next job is that in terms of uh, map the things into a paragraph, I'm going to map the things uh, into our post item card. So we're going to create a separate component called post item card or post item uh, single. So inside our component folder, we're going to create a new file. I'm going to call it a post item one because we have a different format of the post card. This is going to be the first format, .tsx. 
RFC to have that boilerplate ready. And then at the same time, create a file called post item 1.css. And we want to make sure this file gets linked back. So import period slash post item 1.css, like so. So that's the thing we need. And then if you think about it from the post, instead of posting the things into a paragraph, what we're going to do here is that I changed it. <coughs> I, I, we're going to map this thing into a post item 1. Okay, something like that. And then we pass this item as the property value into our child component so that our child component can access the features of that post item. Okay, so when I think about it, what do we need? Like what I said, there's, there's a large post item and there's a small post item. They all follow the same sort of a format except the brief and the avatar. So I'm going to make a property value called uh, large. First, we assign the key to it. The key will be item dot underscore. I'm going to create a property value called large, which is going to be in a Boolean. So we set this one to true or false. Okay, we say false. And the next thing to do is that we're going to pass in the item itself. So it's the item equals to the item itself. So now we have passed in that one. So since we have um, defined three things and over here, and back to our, uh, this has to be underscore, yeah, underscore. Um, back to our child component, we have to take all of these properties, okay? So inside our child component, we do the object destructuring, and first we destructure the large property, secondly we destruct the item, and then we define their data type. So we say large, it's going to be in a boolean, uh, that's all. An item is going to be an object, and for each property of the object that we have defined it, we have the ID, which is going to be a string, and we have the image, which is going to be a string as well, and we have the category, which is going to be a string. All this co all this property comes from the database. If you look at it, we have all the database that has been predefined. So now in the TypeScript, we just have to define the data type before we use them. Uh, if you're doing the project with JavaScript, JavaScript is a very loose programming language. It doesn't really care what data type is. But because of that, it's easy to hack, it's easy to alter it. But this one is more strict. So date, we want it to be a string. And title, oops, not a title tag. Uh, we want it to be a string. And the next one, we have the brief. We want it to be a string and avatar. We want it to be a string. Author. We want it to be a string as well. So now we have everything. I want to copy this and put it into our parents component here as well because we need to define the item the same format over here. Okay. So now we have that one done. And now we are ready to use this down here. So for the post item one template, what I'm going to do, I'll put in the template I have previewed and do a brief explanation. So this is our template. We're going to import uh, one next component called link. So you can jump into different pages. So what I did here is inside a class name, we give a customized class name called post entry one. And we're doing a ternary operator because some of the post card is large. Uh, the remaining ones are small, so we're going to check, do you want a large card or not? If the large is true, we're going to include the class name LG, otherwise it's undefined. Pretty simple, right? And then the first bit of it is that we use the anchor tag, which is a link tag, to give the user the chance to go to another page, which is the postman slash item ID. But so far, we haven't created that route or order page yet, so just leave it there. And then we want to load the image of that post um, and showing as a background. And then for the post meta, we're going to show the item the category. We're going to show the date. This date comes in as a, a very complex format in this format. As you can see, this is the date that we get from the database. Same for the routes. If you look at the dates, if you retrieve it straight away, it'll come back in this format, which is really messy. So what we do, we did a bit of cleaning to the date. We'll create a new date and then 
turn it into two local date string, E and U S, and that way we'll show it at a normal date. Okay, and then also we included the link for the user to click on the title. Also, we'll take the user to that specific individual page. This is the purpose. And the remaining body will only be rendered on the DOM if it's for the large card. If the large is true, we're going to show um, the, the avatar and author's information like so. Otherwise, this part will be null. Basically means disappearance. Okay, so this is the logic for our card. And once we've done that, uh, if we're going back to our item, as you can see, the things has been successfully loaded. Had a small card with the images, with the category, the title, and also the date. Even though it looks pretty ugly now because we haven't done a CSS yet, but uh, we are presenting the the data in our correct format. Okay. So the next thing to do is to include our post one CSS to make it look nicer. I put it in over here. Just uh, change the margin and the bottom and the size. It'll be looks much better. So once we've done that, we're going back to see. Should be slightly better. Uh, the reason is because we didn't wrap it in our bootstrap scene. I'll fix it really quick. Come back to our post. So far, we mapped our items uh, inside a container straight away, but uh, we are using a bootstrap template, so we are supposed to wrap these things inside the columns. So what we're going to do is that uh, we keep this part, but inside our container, we create a new row. And also, uh, we'll give a G5. That's a gap. We we'll give them some gap. So inside the row, we're gonna separate our post into different columns. As you can see, the original, the first one, I'm gonna take a four column, and then um, the next part, the remaining part, is going to take, say for example, eight columns. So four columns plus eight columns equals to twelve columns, which is one row, and that is going to be okay. So I also like to divide things into this way. So what I will do. Once we have that row, uh, firstly we're going to create a column, LG4, that's for that heading news. And then for our one, we're just going to say div.column LG8, so that's going to be for the right hand side. So this four column, eight column represents, this is the four column, the remaining are the eight columns. Okay? And inside the eight columns, we're going to present something, which is our card, our small card. So inside here, <clears throat> we're going to create a new row. And this row also comes in with a gap. And inside here, we're going to further divide it into uh, different columns. Let's see. So this is a column. Inside a column, we're going to evenly divide it into three parts. So there's four column, another four column, another four column. Okay. So here we're going to have uh, this template. I'm just going to copy and paste. One, two, three. So the, the beauty with the bootstrap is that you set up a template first and then you fill in the content and the format will be automatically adjusted for you. Okay? So now we are pretty much targeting at the eight column on the right hand side and inside this row we have the three columns and uh, the first columns uh, uh, three parts. The first part takes the four columns. We are now targeting on this one. Okay? So what I can also do is that I put in this entire JavaScript code, a cut, and we can fill it in uh, into this bit. Paste, okay. And after that, I'm just gonna add a bit of more border class name to this full column by saying we want some border start, border start, and we want to have a custom border like so. And the last job, we have put it into the right position. Last job is for us to uh, uh, copy and paste in our post CSS so the entire page can be properly adjusted. It's just a very simple code. On a smaller size, we want to make sure that the custom border um, display none. Okay, that's all. So now, if I going back to our page, as you can see, this thing looks much decent now because it only takes um, this bit. It's like the the eight column on the right hand side has been divided into three parts and our items only gonna take the first part. Okay? So it looks much better. When we post the more items into it, uh, it'll fill up the space as you post. Okay? But so far we're all good. 
So and next, what we're going to do is to uh, create another API endpoint. Because so far, if we look at our API endpoint, uh, we only have uh, the routes for uh, get all and also the post. But, and ideally, we're supposed to have uh, an individual uh, RESTful API page. So for example, we want the, the get by ID, the get single, uh, the put request, also request the ID, and also the delete request, also request the ID. Right? So we have to build the remaining RESTful API before we can complete the home page. Because on the home page, this uh, top news, head news, uh, is going to be fetched by an individual one. So we'll have to do one. So back to our API endpoint, what we're going to do inside the post items, I'll make this one slightly bigger, post items folder, we create another folder called square bracket ID. This is the React way for dynamic handling, dynamic routes. Okay. So if you create a square bracket that contains the ID, the Next.js will know that this one will render all the ID individually um, one by one. So inside the ID, we create another file called route.ts. This route.ts is different from the previous one. The previous one is for the entire item. We get all, this is a post, but this one is for individual. You must know the ID to be able to handle this. So what I will do, I'll show you how to create the routes, the dynamic routes for each individual item. Firstly, in this file, we're going to again import our DB connection and also, oops, and also uh, I'm going to import the module. So we're going to import the post item module from the modules. And then we're going to set up our connection to the database. So we say DB connect, we call this function. So the Umango DB can be connected over here. And then we're going to export another async function. So this function will also be in a get request. However, we're going to use some parameters here, saying pretty much we're going to get the uh, request. And that thing is going to be in a request object. Uh, that's the first thing. And uh, secondly, we're going to do the fetch of the routes parameter. Because if you look at the original project, whenever the project you click on, It'll give you that ID, right? The ID will be contained in your routes. So we must take this ID as the routes parameter and pass into our API. So what it means is that here we're going to pass in this params. And uh, we know this params is going to be an object. And what we want is the ID of it. And that's the data. That's going to be a string. Okay. So this is what we need. And inside the function, what we're going to do is to make a find the request to the MongoDB database and find that one with a specific ID. So here we say const post item single and await and post item dot find by ID. So if you know the ID, you can pass in the ID straight away. So here we say params dot ID. So we get from the routes parameter and we fetched ID, which is a string. However, like before, I do not want that version to be included. So I say select uh, minus double underscore B. So we can remove the version property from the database. That's the first step. Okay. And once we've done that, we're supposed to return a JSON to the, to the DOM. So the user can access the JSON and bring it back to the front end. So we, we say return response.json. And here we say post item. So now we have that ID has been found from our post item module in the database. And we assign it to a variable called a post item. And we convert that item into the JSON format data and deliver it in our routes. OK, so that's our logic. However, what if we catch any errors? So we should probably the best way is to cut these things and put them into a try catch block. So we try to access the item by this ID from the database. If it's success, we're going to deliver it as a JSON. Otherwise, if we got any errors, we're still going to return something, but we're going to return a new response. Inside this new response, we're going to do some uh, JSON format um, data by saying JSON stringify. We're going to also in the response, 
delivering a message and the message is going to be no item found for this ID so let the user know that your ID is invalid we couldn't find it all right so once we've done that we're gonna have to return a status code status code of uh, four of four 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 stands for not found okay and we have to wrap this thing inside the curly braces that's all right so now we have our get a single request so we make the request based on the rest parameter if it's success we can find the data and uh, we put the data uh, assign it into a variable and uh, we return it as a JSON. If not, catch any errors, basically means the ID is invalid, we couldn't find it in the database. We also pass back the message in the JSON format saying that uh, no, no item is found and we put a status code to 404. Yeah. That's our logic for the get single request. And once we have this, we're going back to our post component because in the initial four column here, we're supposed to put in, um, which is the head news, this one. Sorry, this one. So this has to be fetched by individual ID, all right? So what I mean by that, if you go to your MongoDB, you will see that uh, the first item, that thing is a top news, which is true. And the one that is top news will have this ID. So what you can do, I'm just showing you this trick. In the real world, uh, this is probably gonna be handled in a better way. I'm just trying to show you how to fetch by individual ID. So this is the ID we're gonna use and back to our editor so what we're going to do here is uh, i put this id here and i comment that out for now later on we're going to use it we're going to write another function and this function will allow us to fetch the individual item so best way is to put it below the get item data so we say const get a single post data right we write a new function which is also going to be the arrow function and here we must pass in a parameter, which is the ID, and that is going to be a string. And inside this function, we're going to write another fetch from the backend. So we say fetch. Uh, sorry. We're going to fetch backtick, period slash, API slash, post items. And we want to pass in ID as the route parameter. So here is the place. So once you've done that, your backend will be able to do so, right? So going to the postman to see if it works. And this is the, the one that I created for get element by ID. So remember the ID that we just copy and paste over here. Let's try if we can fetch this one um, on our postman. So I put in the ID in the routes slash API slash postman slash ID, and we send it. As you can see, that thing has been successfully fetched down here with the entire thing, okay? So even though you go to your local host, here you put in that ID in your backend routes and you hit enter, again, we still can access this item without any problem, okay? So that means the thing that we pass in the routes over here must be working slash API slash postman slash ID, which matches this part. The domain comes in as natural. You don't have to add it in manually. You just need to add in the remaining part to your routes. Okay, so that's our logic. And then, if this one has been fetched successfully, it's gonna return us with a promise. And inside our promise, we'll have the response. And what we wanna do is to check the response status. So we say response. If response.status triple equal to 404, that basically means we couldn't find it, and then what we're gonna do is to uh, router dot push. We're gonna let this application push us back to slash not found. We haven't built a not found yet, but later on we will build the not found page. It'll push us back to that not found page. Okay. Otherwise, if we can't find it, we're just gonna return response.json. This is gonna be some validation check, just in case the user put some random data there trying to fetch it from our database. We have to protect it. Right? Otherwise, there's a chance our database can be hacked or somewhere. So that's one thing. Once we've done that, we go to another line. We say, this will have another promise. And then we want to set our local status to that data that we fetch from the backend. So instead of having one local state variable, we can have another one. So we say const 
item and set item double equals to use state which is going to be an empty object so we say this one going to be empty object like so and here we're just going to set our local state variable to that one data set item the singular one to data so now you have a fetch data from the back end and then you set your local item um, variable to that data and then last step after this if we catch any error so we say catch error and what we're going to do is to uh, console.log.error so e dot message like so yeah that's all that's all the functions we need to fetch the single item somebody may ask where do we trigger this function again we trigger this function inside our use effect hook so here in the use effect hook we say get single post the data and inside you must pass in that ID string which is the one that we recorded here okay so we put that one here as a parameter uh, this is because you know which ID is going to be the top one and if you do not want to do it in this way there's also going to be some fancy way to do so we can use filter set up properties for different news say for example you can have another property inside your mongodb say this is going to be the headline this is going to be the head news for the, for the day and you set it to true and you can do a search to the database find out which one with the headline property is true and that one is going to be picked up as the one showing on the top on the, at the first post okay so that's going to be a, a maybe a fancy way and uh, in this tutorial i'm just going to use this way because this is the best way to show you that how to get an individual item by this ID. All right, we write a function and put in the ID number there. So now we have that. Uh, we don't need this anymore. So now we have that uh, local state variable item ready, and then we can show that item inside our column four over here. Okay. So to do so, again we are loading our post item one, but this time it's going to be in a large large item card instead of a small one. So what we say, post item one, close that. We're gonna, if it's a large, we're gonna set it to true. Then now you can expand it. And then we have to pass in the item. The item itself equals to the local state variable item. Okay, so that's how we pass it in. We saved it. And if we go into our app over here, Let's see if it's okay. Yeah, it's loading. See, as you can see, once I refresh the page, it'll make another request to the backend to fetch that individual item, and that thing has been successfully loaded in a big card with the brief des description and also the avatar and author's name. Beautiful, right? So we've done this part, and remaining job is gonna be quite easy. What I will do, um, what I'm going to do is to uh, go to the postman because we have heaps of data. Um, I'm just gonna post it using the postman to insert all the data into our database. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to uh, copy my third data. And by the way, this JSON data, you don't have to worry about it. I'll share the post JSON file in the end uh, in the description link, so you can just use them straight away for practice purpose. So this is going to be our third one. Um, I'm just gonna send it to that backend. And now, if we're going back to the MongoDB to see if it has been successful, it's supposed to be because it shows a 201. We don't have to see to, to see it. And the, it returned with a proper response of that object with ID there. As you can see, we have the ID and we have the uh, version, the ID. It shouldn't be have any problem, okay? So the next one, I'm going to send. Delete this one, put in a new one, and we send this one, okay? And we're just gonna go to another one. The Postman is a really handy tool. Uh, even you don't have a front end, you can still test out your back end to see if it's working. And we're just going to send out this one. That one is working. And the next one. Paste in. Send again. And copy that one. Send again. That one's in.
send in send send yeah we're getting there we need to have more news uh, in our database to fill up the space of the website otherwise it will look really really ugly so we need more news more sample news but I'm getting there we only have two more left I think I got 12 12 in total send all right so now we are sending all of them if we make the get all request to the back end we should not get a heap of them to show you in a more obvious way I'm going back to my browser to make that request to the back end and now you can see we have all of these news in our database that has been successfully fetched all right so now we can map this JSON array into our beautiful web page like so okay back to our editor and now we are on post I'm gonna do some modification to the code so all the news can be presented um, in an ideal way so firstly instead of mapping them all we want to choose few items to map as you can see in the original each column only contains three cards all right so we're only allowed to present three cards at a time so here uh, we're not going to map this thing straight away instead we're gonna do we're gonna chain a filter to map it so the way to do so is uh, once once we have the items from the back end that, that's gonna have all the items we're gonna firstly filter out the thing we need what do we need we want to choose those non-trending non-top um, news to be posted in a column over here because the top one is here and the non-top one is supposed to be here the trending one is supposed to be here okay so we have to filter based on the category or based on the, the type of the news so we say here item item and we're gonna have to define the data type here we're gonna use uh, the item is going to be in our object we're gonna use the trending uh, which is going to be the boolean and uh, on the top which is also going to be the boolean so once we have the item we just want to filter out um, those not trending so item dot trending basically means that you want to find a trending item not give this um, not means that you want to choose the opposite all right so this is how you're going to choose it and that's the error line there oh i miss an n over here that thing should disappear not only this we also know the top the non-top news to be chosen out so we say not item top okay so in this filter it's also a javascript higher order array function what it does is that it will choose the item from the array that satisfy your condition the condition that you put in here is that non-trending non-top item okay and it will filter out all of those and the remaining stuff in the array will stay and once we have those we're going to do another job which is going to be a slice slice means that you only want to choose a few of them from the array not all of them because we don't have sufficient space to load all so we say slice 0 to 3 basically means that you only want the first three items that satisfy this filter condition to be chosen out and you map them into the post item 1 card okay so that's our logic just remove the space so once we've done all of these if we're going back to our DOM we're just gonna do a bit of refresh and now you can see the three item has been chosen out right really beautiful and it matches the original one and the top one is gone because the top one only gets to show over here and now this non-trending non-top news gets listed on the side all right so that's gonna be this part of the code and for the column beside it it's actually quite easy what I'm going to do is just gonna copy copy this part and for this one and paste it over here this is our second part of the column I'm gonna add a few more class names to it one is the uh, border start the other one is uh, custom hyphen border like so 
But instead of choosing 0 to 3, what, what I'm going to choose is uh, a 3 to 6. The 6 is not included, so that's going to be 3, 4, 5. We still want um, the next three columns um, to be chosen. Let's see if I made any mistakes. Yeah, I probably copied one extra div, so I removed that. Things are all working okay now. So I'm just going to resave this one. Saved it. Yeah, all good. So this is the column in the middle, uh, which contains four columns. We map the item again down the filter, choose 3 to 4, or 3 to 5, and then map it into our post item 1 card. And now if we're going back to our app, just reload it. Yep, the next three comes out. Looks really beautiful. See, this is the power of um, data mapping in JavaScript. You set up the connection to database. Once you have the data ready in the database, you make the fetch, and then you can map, map them on the DOM the way you want. Really, really great. Okay. So now we have successfully finalized the first three columns in our post. The next job is to create this trending section, this trending area, which is going to be a new card design. Let me just do it right now. So to build this trending area, what we're going to do inside this last part, so let me just show you the structure of the template for this post page again. So we have the container, we have the row, and this is going to be the uh, first four columns in the row. We close that out. And then we have the 8 column. So those two add up together equals to 12 column. And inside this 8 column, we create another row. And the first part in the row is also going to take 4 column, which we have done that. And this is the middle part, also going to take another 4 column. And in the last bit, there's another 4 column, which we're going to build our trending. All right? So inside this 4 column, we create a new div and give the class name called trending. And inside here, we give the h3 title and also name it trending like so and then we're just gonna create a list template to wrap this thing up uh, before I create a JavaScript I should actually uh, create a UL and give a class name called trending post and inside here we just have a JavaScript we need to map our item into the trending post like so on the right hand side and just be a pay attention to the template. The trending UI is different from all others because it has first it has that number showing in a very thick color, and uh, it has the title and it has the um, writer's name, the author's name, but it does not have that background image. So we need to create a new UI template which contain the faded number, the title, the author, like so, and also give them a border to wrap around. So here, what we're gonna do is inside our component, we create a new component called a trending post to have that a new UI template. So we say trending post dot TSX, enter RFC to have that boilerplate ready. And we're just going to create a new file called trending post dot CSS. So we have the according CSS files. And now we're just going to add these two together. So import period slash trending post dot CSS. So that one comes in, right? So I'm just going to quickly um, put in the CSS for the trending. So pretty much we will have a for the trending post. Um, pretty much we'll just have a reset up the border and also uh, change the font size and give the font color and also uh, redefine the paddings and the margins. It's quite easy. It's very easy CSS. I'm pretty sure you could all understand. And by the way, I will share all the CSS files in the end uh, down the link in the description. So if you couldn't be able to catch up, don't you worry about it. Uh, you just need to download the link in the description. All right. So we're back into the training post. And now the next job for us to do is to do the mapping over here because we do have the data and then we want to map that into the training post. Okay. So here what we're going to do is to do items double ampersand and items dot length greater than zero. First, we're going to check if the item exists. If it does, we're going to check if that array um, has some item in it because there are, it, it, could, it could not be an empty array for us to map it. So we must wait until the data is ready so the array won't be empty before we can map it. And once that's done, we're just going to say and items. 
Some people may say that we can map it straight away. No, because remember we have 12 post articles inside our database. If we map it straight away, it's gonna load everything here. What we only want is the trending article to be loaded. And we know that inside our database, each article will have a trending property. Some of them has been set to false, some of them has been set to true. So we only want to pick up the trending true. Um, so those articles, like so, the trending true, trending true, so those articles will be picked up and presented in the trending column. All right? So let's do a filter again to pick up those articles. So we say filter. And inside here, we're going to do the mapping, the filtering. So item, colon, define the data type. It's going to be an object which contains a trending property. And that one is going to be a Boolean, like so. Outside, we're just going to do an arrow function uh, to map that into uh, the trending card we need. So we say we only want those trending true item to be selected. So we say filter, we filter out the item trending which is true, and those things will be left out. And once we filter out everything we need, we're then going to do a map. Inside this map, what we're going to do is map our item. into the object. The object is going to be the trending post component that we, that we just created. So we say trending post, like so. So now our item will be mapped into our trending post component, even though we haven't built the, the trending post component yet, but we are allowed to map it into. All right. So that's pretty much the basic structure. And to make it a, a bit more detail, what we're going to do if you opened up the previous one, you will see the structure. When you do the mapping, you have to define the data type. So we're going to have to do the same thing. So what I will do is to copy the entire part. Instead of writing the item itself, by the way, if you're writing a JavaScript code, this is enough. The JavaScript is a very loose language. It does not require the user to define the data variable type. But when using TypeScript, it's a more accurate one. So whenever you have that variable, you must define the type. So we replace this word with this. That basically means that we're still going to map the item, but here in the curly braces is what we're going to define. The item is going to be an object, and inside the object, we have these properties, and each property has its own data type as well. Okay, That's this long code for. It looks complicated, but when you understand it, it's pretty easy. Okay, So now when we do the posting, we're going to say we have to assign a unique key to that trending post, which is going to be the underscore ID, like so. And then we're going to have that index to be posted as well. And the reason is because if you look at this one, each trending will have a number assigned to it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right? And this number, that we don't have the place to find it. Or we, in your database, you don't have that number there to store it anywhere. So it does not have that property. However, we can use the index of the item inside the items array and the plus 1 to achieve that actual number. So what we're going to do here is first, we're going to trigger another another one inside the curly braces. And we call that our index. And this one is going to be a number. So now we can access the index of the item inside our array. And by the way, this index comes in as a built-in parameter. You do not have to define it anywhere. When you do the mapping, the mapping function comes with the item itself and also the index of the item inside our array. Okay? We just have to define a data type for it. It's going to be a number. And here you can pass that index as a property value to the child component training post. So we say index equals to index. And then the last one we're going to pass in is going to be the item itself. So item equals to item. OK, so now we have everything ready. And the next job is going to the child component uh, to define its properties. We'll have the index and item. And we're going to the child component. First, we're going to do the object destructuring over here. and the first um, property to destructure to is the item, and then we're going to destructure the index. All right. The next job is to define their data type. So the item is going to be an object, and which contain the underscore ID. That is going to be a string, and the title. That is going to be a string. Save it to change the line, and also we're going to have the author. It's also going to be a string. So once you have that item defined, the second one is going to be the index. 
which is going to be a number. So once you define it here, and we go back, you will see that the error line removes away. So this is the beauty with TypeScript. All the data type must be accurate and matched up for the errors to, to, to move away. This will allow very accurate data type to be injected into every single page. All right. So we have that done. And the last job is to finalize our trending post page. And we delete this original one. For this template, we're going to use the list item. If you look at the parent component, you will see all the things have been wrapped into the UL. Right, so this is going to be a list wrapper. So inside here, we're just going to map all the trending, all the trending posts into a list item. So inside this list, we're going to create a anchor tag, a. But alternatively, we could also use that link from the next, and you close that out. It'll work the same way. And inside here, we're just going to have to uh, give a, a href, and inside here, we'll allow the user when you click on the title. Of that trending post, it takes the user to the individual page of the post item. So we say slash post items slash money sign double curly braces items dot underscore id. So even though now we still haven't built this individual page for the post item, but we are still allowed to create a root, the root for it. Later on, we're going to in the app folder create a new folder for this page, and we are ready to link it straight away. All right, so that's the logic. And the next thing is going to create a span, give a class name of number. This one will be used to hold our number of the post. Remember, when we pass in the index, it's going to be the index of the item inside our array, this one here. And if you know the programming language, the, all the index in, from, in the array starts from zero. So here we want to present the item from one. The first one is going to be one. But for the index, the first one, the index is zero. How do we solve that problem? Very easy. We're just going to trigger access that index over here because we have passed in as a property and plus one, do a math. All right. This one will calculate zero plus one is one, one plus one is two. So all the index plus one will give you the correct number of that item inside the list. Okay. So that's one thing. Keep going. We'll give a H3 title and here inside it, we're going to have a item dot title. And last but not least, we're going to include that author. So we say span class name author tab. And then inside the curly braces, we say item dot author like so. So now we are done with all of the uh, training post um, UI template with all of this uh, child property has been used inside the template as well. All right. So the mapping has been done here. Hopefully, uh, finger crossed, this should work. Let's go to our current website and just reload it. As you can see, this thing has been successfully loaded over here with that numbers on, with that titles there, the author's name there, and also the border effects there. All right. So because we have preload the CSS for the trending post, that's why it can show in a very decent way straight away. Okay. And I will share all the CSS files. I say that again. So if you couldn't catch up in the course, just download all the files and assets before you start this tutorial. That's the best idea. All right. So I close this off. And I, this one's done. I close this off. And now we are back to the post. As you could see, that everything over here has been successfully built. I expand all of this. First, it's going to be the heading news, which is this one. That takes the first four columns. And then inside the right hand side, eight columns, we have the um, another four column to hold three posts, another four column to hold three posts, another four columns to hold the trending post. All of them. Okay? So that's pretty much it for the post. And if you look at the original project, I reload the page, you will see this one. You will see this spinning circle rotated around a bit, spinning a bit before the post item gets presented on the browser. I show you again. What is that? Because whenever we're making a request from the database, it's going to be in a, uh, a synchronous behavior of the DOM. All right. You depending on the location of your server, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to get the data straight away immediately. It, it's going to take probably a few seconds for the data to be rendered by the server and put it into the response and your front end can get it. So during this waiting time, we must have some sort of animation to show uh, we are loading the data. All right. But currently, if you see our project, and it's just going to be blank for a while. 
be blank page for a while until the data is ready. This is not going to be perfect. And it's, qu it's not quite obvious so far because we're on the local host. But when you deploy this application on a website, um, it's all remote. Depending on the internet speeds, the location of the server and the database, if anything went wrong, this page can be blank for probably five seconds. That's going to confuse the user. What's happening to your website? All right. So we must have a spinning, a pending animation there while the data is loading to allow the user to know, oh, this is probably loading the data. I'm going to wait. Okay. How do we solve that problem? So far in our code, we haven't got a place to put the loading effects. All right. So our next job is to put in our loading effects. So to create that uh, preloader component, what we're first going to do is to inside a component folder over here. We'll create a new file called preloader.tsx. Enter. And then at the same time, we're going to create another file called preloader.css. Enter. And then the next job is to combine these two together. So we RFC to have that boilerplate ready. And then we import preloader. You know, period slash preloader.css, like so. And then the content of the template is quite easy. It's just going to be the ID of preloader. That's all, right? Because we're going to build all the um, animations using a pseudo element inside a preloader CSS, right? So my next job is to put in a CSS, like so. And now you can see for the preloader, we're going to make sure it's positioned fixed right in the middle. And then we'll create a pseudo element with a top and left position with that border set to the default color and then border radius 50% to achieve a circle with a height and width, uh, with a height and width set to 60%. And then we add on this animation of preloader. This animation down here is going to be from 0% to 100% a rotating effects transform. It rotates from zero degree to 360 degree and indefinitely. Right, it's infinite, so it's a keep running, keep running, keep running, like so. All right, so now we're done the setting for the preloader, and we can close this off. And how do we add this preloader back to our post component? And the logic is that we need to check if the data is ready. If the data is ready to be mapped or to be shown on a DOM, uh, we should make sure that the, the preloader disappear. Otherwise, while the data is loading not ready yet, we should present the preloader on the DOM. So here, instead of doing the mapping straight away, after checking if the data is ready, we're going to do the ternary operator to show the preloader. It's very easy to fix, right? Just going to adjust the code a bit. From this item mapping down here before the last curly braces, we cut, we cut everything. And then over here, delete that double ampersand. We say question mark. We're going to ask if the data is ready. If it does, we show the data, right? Otherwise, colon, we're going to show the preloader. It's going to be preloader, like so. All right. So this is going to be a ternary operator. We ask if the data is ready. If it's not an empty array, if it, if it does, we're going to map the data into our uh, post item card. Otherwise, we're going to show the preloader to the user. All right. Very simple idea. And the next thing to do is to fix this one as well. So we're just going to cut. And here, we say question mark colon. Uh, in between, we're going to put in that uh, uh, mapping. First, we check the data is ready. If it's ready, we do the mapping. Otherwise, we're going to present that preloader, like so. All right? Same logic. And the last one as well, we're just going to cut all of these. Delete this one. And we're going to ask if it's ready. If it's ready, data is ready, we're going to show the mapping. Otherwise, we present the preloader to the user. All right, so this is the way to handle the preloader in this project. Uh, before the coming of Next.js, um, I developed my application mostly using the MERN style. It's like the uh, React.js, Express.js, MongoDB, Node.js. So if that's the way, normally we handle the preloader using a state variable called loading. All right, and we use something called Reduct. Uh, you will use Redux to handle the state change. But that's another story, which is more fancy and complicated. But with the coming of Next, uh, things suddenly become a lot easier uh, to handle. Actually, the Next also have a loading, the naturally built loading page. So you can use that one as well to handle the data loading effect. But here for this project, we just use this ternary operator to show the preloader. In a future project, I will show you how to build um, with the Next.js preloading effects page. All right. So now we have that. 
Let me see if this one gonna be working on our DOM. So we're back to our DOM. If I reload, you can see that preloader has run really quickly and disappear. This will probably gonna take about half a second. It's very quick. You can rarely observe it. Yeah. It shows probably half a second and data comes in. And this is because we are running on the local host and we are we have the data in the caching. So it's not going to delay a lot of time. The preloader will only be presented for a very short time. If you have this one deployed on a remote server, the preloader will show. All right. And also, once we build the entire application, the data will be um, there will be more data loading animations coming in and the preloader will also show. Say, for example, for my original um, project which was uh, currently deployed on localhost 3000 if I reload it you will see clearly of that preloader and that is because I'm loading the entire application not just the home page we have a few other pages as well the post page the create page and the about page all of these pages have that preloader uh, installed so if any page contains the data that is not ready that preloader will be running all right this is the reason why you can see it but so far, with our current application, we have only finalized, uh, nearly finalized the home page, and there's not much data loading delay. So you only get to see the preloader in a very short time. Okay. All right, that's pretty much uh, the end of this uh, tutorial, the first session. And in the next session, what I'm going to show you is going to be more cool stuff. First, in the next session, we're going to build another page called the post page, and inside the post page, we're going to put in the all the post list item here and amazingly you're allowed to click into any one of those and access the individual page of that post all right and inside this individual page you get to see the content the paragraph of the post article and also on the sidebar you will have a different categories to show different kind of a post for you to jump in and if you click on any of those it'll take you to that individual page straight away right all the things are working on my website and most amazingly uh, that I like to highlight is this two button. One is the delete button. I don't want to click it because once I click it, it'll delete item from our database. And the other one is going to be this button, this um, edit button. If I click it, um, you are allowed to edit the current content of the post. All right, pretty much we are making the put request to the back end. And also for this create post page, if you click it, here you can enter a new post information. And once you post the item, this one will be sent to the back end as a post request. And one more item, one more post item will be added to our MongoDB database. All right. So and the remaining things are going to be the about page with a cool about layout with our team members and also the contact page, which allow you to do the form validation and post the user information to the back end as well. All right. So in the next session, I'm going to show you all of this fancy stuff. We'll have more rest of API to build, which is going to be the post request and also the delete request, the put request. So if you like my video, please subscribe my channel. And also, uh, if you do have any questions, leave a comment down below. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. And thank you for watching this video. I'll see you in the next session. Bye for now.